All right, well, welcome back. Good afternoon, everybody. Good to see you all back. And um, first of all, I wanted to say hello and welcome you to our second um, GSA Acquisition Policy Federal Advisory Committee meeting. We had our first in September. And so we're glad to be meeting today. I am Boris Avratia. I am the designated federal officer for the committee. And then also have my colleague, Stephanie. Stephanie, you want to introduce yourself real quick? Good day. My name is Stephanie Hardison. I'm the deputy designated federal officer. Thank you. So we are we're very glad to see you all today here. I will say at the onset that we are recording this meeting uh, and we will make it available just as we did the, the first meeting, which is available on our website, committee website. Uh, we'll have the presentations and the agenda and everything that we're we're doing here. Uh, before I get started, I want to make sure that we go through just a, a quick roll call here. And, and what I'm going to do is just going to read off the list of names here and then just do a very brief. Uh, you can just unmute yourself and say here, present, and um, wave your hand, and then we'll go ahead and record that. So, Farad. Uh, present. All right. Uh, Denise. I know Denise had a conflict this afternoon. Uh, Gail. Present. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Luke. Present. All right. Thank you, Luke. Uh, Richard. Present. Okay. Thank you, Richard. Leslie. Okay. I think Leslie had a conflict as well. Um, Daryl Daniels. Present. Okay. Nicole. Okay, wait for Nicole here. Uh, Antonio. Present. All right. Mark. Okay, wait for Mark. Uh, Susan. Uh, Mamie. Mamie, I thought I heard something. Uh, David? Yeah. Okay. And Boris, I see that Nicole has just joined as well. Okay, got it. Thank you. Present, if you mean me. Yep. Yep. Okay. And then we have uh, Daryl McKissack. No, she's, I believe she's on travel today. Uh, Amlin. Present. All right. Jenny. Present. Okay, Anne. Present. Yeah, hello, Anne. Glad you were able to get in. Hi, right. thank you. Yeah, Steve. I'm here. All right, uh, Kristen. Present. Okay, uh, Stacy. Stacy has a conflict. Nigel. Present. Okay, Clyde. Present. Okay, Anish. Present. All right, uh, Keith, I believe Keith is out sick today. Um, and then we have David already, and I know Kimberly is out as well. All righty, very well. So we have a quorum, so let's proceed. I wanted to let you know that the GAP Act is a discretionary GSA Federal Advisory Committee. So we are governed by the requirements of the Federal Advisory Committee Act. And the Federal Advisory Committee Act is a law that is a longstanding American tradition of looking for objective and expert advice from all sectors of society. And we're using this advice to tackle the most complex uh, issues and challenges we take on in the federal government. And so we're doing this in a very uh, effective and also very transparent way. And that's what we invite you members of the public to join in today. So uh, in terms of your participation, um, there's a couple of things I wanted to mention. First of all, we want you to feel free to, at any time during this meeting, provide any comments, questions, anything that comes to mind, yeah, feel free to use our inbox. So we're gonna do this via email, uh, which is gapfac at gsa.gov. That is G-A-P-F-A-C at gsa.gov. So feel free to use that inbox at any time, and uh, we will be glad to, to take a look and see if you're any, any comments that are coming our way. 
We have uh, been doing a, a great deal of just thinking since our first meeting as to how do we establish our, our committee here in terms of subcommittees. So much of the focus today will be on subcommittees. Um, but before I go any further, I want to bring um, to your attention here and want to um, introduce our committee chairs and co-chairs. Um, Troy Cribb, who is our committee chair, and Cassius Butts, who is our committee co-chair. And so I would like to pass it on to them and they will facilitate and lead our conversations from here on out. So, Troy. Okay, great. Thank you, Boris. Um, and good afternoon, everybody. It is so great to be with you here today at the second meeting of the GSA Acquisition Policy Federal Advisory Committee, the, the GAP FAC. I am Troy Cribb. I am the chair of the GAP FAC. Welcome all of our committee members and also those of you from the public who are dedicating your time to being part of this effort. And I also just uh, do want to also thank the, the GSA staff uh, who have worked hard in uh, helping get us set up so that we can conduct, conduct this meeting. At our inaugural meeting uh, just last month, we were very honored to hear from GSA Administrator Robin Carnahan, who reminded us that October marked the 50th anniversary of the Federal Advisory Committee Act uh, and reminded us of the importance of its purpose, which is, as, as, Boris, as Boris just alluded to, to ensure that the executive branch benefits from a wide range of public opinions and inputs as it develops policy and to help ensure that the public has some transparency and access into how the policy is made. And she further went on to, to emphasize uh, just how important uh, this framework is for the timing of, of this committee. And again, I'll note this is the first acquisition advisory committee that GSA has had in 15 years. We're meeting at a very important time as Congress has just recently passed laws and uh, granted um, substantial appropriations for GSA and, and the whole government to be making uh, really important investments in addressing climate issues and uh, to uh, put us on track uh, towards sustainability in our government operations. And the task of this committee is to be here to advise GSA on how it can use its tools and authorities to help our uh, GSA and the whole of government meet these very important challenges. Uh, I just also wanna um, give a quick thanks again to uh, the Associate Administrator of GSA, Crystal Brumfield, who joined us uh, at our first meeting and shared her excitement for our assembly and, and gave us an overview of some of GSA's climate and sustainability initiatives. And also wanna thank um, Jeff Kosas, uh, GSA's chief senior ex uh, procurement executive, who I've come to learn is our birthday boy today, um, who led us through uh, a, a, an overview of the areas that our subcommittees are gonna cover uh, to help us better understand some of the challenges that GSA is facing so that we can steer the work of this committee to be as effective as possible in helping GSA meet those challenges. So today I'm extremely excited that we are gonna be able to announce the all-stars who have been nominated to lead our subcommittees. And then we're gonna hear from like three just really outstanding experts from GSA. who are gonna dive into the three areas uh, that our subcommittees are gonna cover. And again, those are policy and practice, um, uh, industry partnership and acquisition workforce. And, and these experts are really gonna lead us through what GSA is already doing in these areas and help us better understand uh, the, the challenges again so that, that we can get to work and make recommendations that will help GSA, the whole of our government and our, our, our country uh, as we address some really urgent challenges. And with that, I will turn to my distinguished co-chair in this effort, Cassius Butts, who is going to lead us through the introduction of the subcommittee chairs and co-chairs. Unless we just lost you, Cassius, are you still there? I will uh, see. Uh, about oh. now. Okay, yeah, you, we can hear you. We, we just lost your... Um, your video. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I think 
you know. We see you again. We see yeah, you we again. see we see you again. Oh, okay. Okay. Oh, I'll, 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 you're up there. Okay. Okay. I'll be expedient. Thank you for everyone and thank you for our all who are, who are joining us today. And of course, we'd like to thank the administrator and all those who have actually uh, come together to really uh, add to something that's very historic. So thank you very much. Of course, Troy, thank you for your leadership as well in leading this initiative. Um, to go jump right in, our gap backs up committee members uh, as it relates to policy and practice. Uh, we have 14 members, um, which is going to uh, be led by our nominee chair, Steve Schooner. Uh, we also have Luke uh, Basis, who is a nominee, who was our co-chair. Um, uh, again, for our policy and practice, we have 14 uh, members who will be part of that initiative. For our industry partners, we have 16, which will be led uh, by nominee Kristen Siever. She is our chair. And Farad Ali, uh, nominee, is our co-chair for industry partnerships. For Acquisition Workforce 8, uh, we have Daryl Daniels nominee as chair. And we also have Nicole Darnell uh, as a nominee for our co-chair with eight members of that uh, um, subcommittee as well. So we're really excited. Uh, we had some really robust conversations uh, leading up to today. And we're looking forward to having engaged conversations and adding some really great value as we uh, have the day to continue on. Thank you. Troy? Well, well, great. And I think, um, Boris, if we're okay on, on time, uh, we might just give each of the, the subcommittee chairs and co-chairs a minute or so to um, reintroduce themselves um, uh, for, for yeah. those who might not have been on the first call and, and just, uh, if, they, if they'd like, just say a, a couple words about um, what uh, their excitement and expectations for their subcommittees. Yeah, absolutely, please. Okay. All right. Um, well, Steve and Luke, why don't we start with you? Okay, so for those of you who I haven't met before, I'm Professor Steve Schooner. I'm at the George Washington University Law School, where we offer a number of graduate degrees related to government contracts and public procurement. Before that, I served as a career SES in the Office of Federal Procurement Policy, and I also had background in private practice, the Justice Department, and the Army. I'm ecstatic to be involved in this initiative. I've been working for the last couple of years with NCMA, the National Contract Management Association, to move its membership and its organization up the learning curve on sustainable procurement. But I think the real thing to keep in mind here is that our challenge is immense. The federal acquisition workforce is busy. They're pulled in many, many directions. And asking them to engage in sustainable procurement entails a massive learning curve and a serious change ma management challenge. We need some really strong and clear messages from leadership that it's important to adapt to and to mitigate climate change. But at the end of the day, I think one of the biggest problems we have is to overcome the longstanding and entrenched tyranny of low prices. We need to think differently about value, or as the economists would say, we need to internalize the externalities or the effects of our purchasing decisions if we want to make more climate change conscious decisions. But anyway, I think it's a great task and I'm ecstatic to be involved. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Luke Bassis. I'm the Deputy Director of Procurement at the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey. Uh, the Port Authority is a mega transportation agency responsible for some of the New York and New Jersey regions busiest airports, shipping terminals, bridges, tunnels, the path rail system, and multiple real estate sites, including the World Trade Center. Uh, the professional staff at my agency have long been innovation and thought leaders in sustainability and resilience. And I really hope to bring some of that experience and some of what we learned over time to this effort. I myself have spent the last 14 years in procurement at the Port Authority in multiple capacities from developing policies to drafting clauses, creating guidelines, ensuring compliance with federal regulations, uh, developing and managing innovative procurements in all fields. Uh, I have had real pragmatic transactional experience in what works, what doesn't, and how to implement public policies into attainable goals. This subcommittee has been given the opportunity of a lifetime to make policy recommendations, to support robust climate, and sustainability action for the world's largest buyer, the US government. I see our biggest challenge as really figuring out where to start 
Do we go big and broad and chisel away a little bit at the large universe of US government spending? Or do we take a scalpel uh, and go by industry, take deep dives to cater recommendations that will fit smaller buckets of spend, but could have a larger cumulative impact? I am thrilled uh, to be part of this effort and look forward to working with this subcommittee to understand these issues better and to develop policy recommendations that will move markets. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you, Stephen. That was a great start to a uh, discussion of, of what our subcommittees are going to take on. So why don't we move next to um, Kristen and Farad, who are, will be our nominees for chair and co-chair of our industry partnership subcommittee. Great. And good afternoon, everybody. I'm pleased to be here with all of you. Thank you for the opportunity to serve as chair of the industry partnership subcommittee. Um, I'm really honored and committed. I spent 30 years at the United States Postal Service and loved every day of serving the American people by leveraging technology, fostering innovation, and leading awesome teams of dedicated employees. After retiring, I've been fortunate to accept a position where I continue to support the mission of government across federal civilian agencies with technology, solutions, and services. The importance and impact of the strong partnership between industry and government is well known, and it plays out across our country every day. We are eager to advance on the important work ahead of seeking public input, fostering ideas, and making recommendations that support the charter of this Federal Advisory Committee and help protect the future of our planet. Thank you. Hey, uh, good afternoon, good morning, or good day to everyone who's on the call. Thank you for letting me be a participate as a co-chair on this committee. Really excited about being able to utilize my diverse background and, and being able to support this work. Um, in my early in my career, I was a banker and had a chance to do lending for corporations and cities and towns around places and spaces to make sure that we had um, economic development and community. After doing that, I served uh, working in a nonprofit, um, supporting the development and engagement of minority owned businesses and women owned businesses and veteran owned businesses, working with the US Department of Commerce, work with the US Department of Transportation, um, working with uh, public allies as a part of our community service awards. And later on, went ahead to work for the National Minority Supply Development Council, which is the largest organization that focuses on working with minority owned businesses and its ability to partner with corporations. Um, during that time, I had been an elected official, um, understanding the importance of, of working with government and communities, and additionally worked as a the chairman of the board of the Raleigh Durham Airport Authority, International Airport Authority, understanding the importance of how aviation works. But truly, we live in a community that we have diversity is, is necessity of diversity of thought, diversity of utilization. And as was mentioned earlier, the world's largest purchaser of, the, of, of, of goods and services is the US government. And the, also, this is the world's greatest diversity opportunity to make sure for the future generations that we can have shared prosperity. So in my work, I'm really excited to be on this industry partnership to show how we can have alignment between government, business, nonprofits and community. Thank you for allowing me to be here today. Thank you so much, Kristen and Farad. I think uh, Cassius and I are, are all on board in thinking that this is really an historic opportunity for our country. And, and, and thank you for uh, your willingness to, to serve as uh, subcommittee leads. So um, finally, we will go to um, the Acquisition Workforce Subcommittee, uh, which will be uh, where, where our nominees are uh, Daryl Daniels as chair and Nicole Darnall as co-chair. So I'll turn it over to the both of you. Hi, thank you. Um, I'm Daryl Daniels, CEO and president of Jacobs and Daniels. And like the others on this call, I'm really pleased to be with you today and, and honored to be nominated for this committee. And then to be um, nominated as chair um, of the subcommittee, actually. So my work in the private sector is um, a consulting, uh, operating, and support to uh, air, municipal airports um, around the country. We intersect with the um, airport procurement, um, city procurement, FAA procurement. Um, so. I've had some experience, you know, on this side of the fence, you know, dealing with procurement officers and dealing with um, the processes and procedures that it takes to, you know, work for cities, states, and municipalities. I also um, volunteer and support um, our 
trade industries, various trade industries in the aviation space and work with uh, those organizations as they develop policies and procedures around sustainable development for um, our airports around the country. So clearly preparing uh, the workforce and upskilling up their experience and expertise is essential. I hope that we can discover and advance tools and policies, you know, through the work of the subcommittee that will um, provide recommendations to empower the workforce uh, to continue to make um, buying decisions um, for uh, the federal government and obviously um, provide taxpayer value. And again, as for the work of the subcommittee, I, I look forward to hearing from a series of experts um, in the subject matter and, and having them to provide us with information and guidance. So uh, our, our recommendations will help develop the workforce at all levels. Nicole? Great, thanks, Daryl. I'm Nicole Darnell. I am Foundation Professor of Management and Public Policy at Arizona State University School of Sustainability. I am also Director of ASU's Sustainable Purchasing Research Initiative, where I've engaged more than 4,000 governments at all levels globally to learn about the barriers and facilitators of sustainable purchasing. I'm former Associate Dean of ASU School of Sustainability. I am really excited about this opportunity and I look forward to learning from you all, your diverse voices and to bringing forward the knowledge that we have learned within ASU Sustainable Purchasing Research Initiative to the work involved in this massive shift required towards reorienting the workforce towards embedding sustainability in federal acquisition. Thank you. Thank you so much, Daryl and Nicole, and I think uh, everyone can see how excited Cassius and I are about um, the amazing leaders we have uh, to, to head up our, our subcommittees. Thank you again all so much for uh, enlisting in this effort, and, and again, I'm just struck by uh, really how fortunate um, all of the subcommittees and, and the committee as a whole are by just a diversity of backgrounds and experiences that everyone brings to the table here. So I think um, we are kind of on schedule, maybe a few minutes behind, but we'll turn now just to diving into uh, the discussions with our guest speakers. And again, I'm so thrilled to have um, just, just three outstanding speakers from GSA who again are gonna walk us through some of the efforts that GSA already has uh, ongoing in our different subcommittee areas uh, and the challenges that they face so that we can start a converse or continue our conversation. I wish I should say, because we, we, we started this at our last meeting, but um, to be able to, to try to tee up issues and topics that our subcommittees can really go deep on to, um, lay out some uh, options for tangible outcomes um, in our recommendation. So why don't we turn to our first speaker, Nick West. Um, and I'm pleased to say I know all of our speakers today and can vouch for how amazing they are. Um, we're starting with Nick, who's going to um, speak to some, some issues that will be important to the Policy and Practices Subcommittee. Nick is the acting director of the Office of Acquisition Policy, Integrity, and Workforce at GSA. He's had over uh, 17 years of experience at GSA. He oversees acquisition policy, including workforce policy, acquisition performance management, and enterprise-wide supply, supply chain risk management. Um, a lot on his plate. Thank you for being with us today, Nick, and I will turn it over to you. Thanks, Troy. Uh, thank you all to the committee for your service and efforts in helping GSA think through some of these important issues. Uh, I have some slides today, uh, perfect, that will walk us through um, at a very high level some of the different acquisition policies, some of the things the GSA has done in the uh, sustainable acquisition already, and some of the key acquisition programs that GSA runs. Uh, at the end, if there's time, I know there's another group that will focus on acquisition of workforce that Jeff Birch is going to talk about. Uh, but GSA also has some policies in that area that you should be aware of, so we'll cover some of that. 
Uh, so the first slide, it kind of sets the stage with the different types of acquisition policy here. Um, there are three different layers. So first you have the government-wide policies, the laws, the EOs, the OMB memos, and the FAR rules where uh, GSA has a role, but it's not necessarily the final vote. So often we play the role of that subject matter expert giving our advice to the decision makers. Uh, but again, we're not the final vote. So my team operates more in this middle bucket where we have much more control. Um, and this is where we implement the government-wide policy. Or we set some of the policies in terms of how GSA will operate ourselves. Uh, so considering there's pretty clear direction, I think, at the government-wide level to go by sustainable solutions, this is kind of where we're looking for the most uh, information from you all and some uh, first for recommendations. There's a third bucket where our Federal Acquisition, Acquisition Service or the Public Building Service will issue policies specific to their GSA program. Uh, and I'll get into some of the specific programs uh, later that might be relevant. But I wanted you to note this is another type of policy that we issue and uh, one that I think we would certainly welcome recommendations from, uh, from the subcommittee. Next slide, slide please. So uh, the first bullet on this slide gives a link to the FAR case report, Federal Acquisition Regulation Report. That's again in that first bucket, the government-wide policy tier. Uh, this is more for awareness. So you know some of the things that the FAR Council is wrestling with. It's updated every week or so. So I find this is the best uh, resource to keep track of all the things that they're doing. But again, we're interested more in the uh, GSA implementation policy uh, bucket. And so this slide walks through some of the steps we've already taken in this area. Um, and if you ask me, I think we're, we're one of the leaders in government and guidance in this area. Uh, so uh, hopefully this will be helpful. Um, there's a couple of links here uh, on the slide. The first policy, uh, is the GSAM case. This is one where we recognize that uh, sustainable acquisition, uh, as Professor Schooner already mentioned, this is an area of expertise uh, that the contracting team needs a lot of help. Uh, help tailoring the acquisition strategies to get more sustainable outcomes. Uh, they need experts. Um, so one of the things that we did in our policy here is we um, we added the chief sustainability officer to the acquisition review boards. Uh, these are like the big planning meetings that we have for some of our uh, big high risk acquisitions uh, to offer their expertise in this area. Um, so this is probably a good time to kind of give my philosophy on the three buckets of, of things that we typically see in the sustainable acquisition, uh, sustainable uh, procurements. So you can cover it basically in uh, three different areas. Uh, bucket one is the performance requirements, where you're describing what you need, the contractor to do, or the deliverable, um, and you consider how the work's performed, and this is where you infuse sustainability into the requirements themselves. The second bucket is in the uh, evaluation criteria, where you're picking winners and losers based on the different approaches the vendors are going to take, uh, and then the third is the clauses or the terms that we make as uh, part of the contract. This is more of a compliance a uh, thing that we would require as part of the contract. So it's clear that uh, some of our different programs choose different approaches based on what we're buying. Uh, and many of you may have heard of the SF tool that helps uh, the acquisition team walk through kind of that decision-making process. So one of the policies we put in place is uh, as part of your acquisition planning um, for the team to consciously decide which of those things they want to infuse into the acquisition uh, and then document that in the acquisition plan. Uh, the second policy that's outlined on the slide is the acquisition letter. Uh, this is one where we, uh, it's more of a call for innovation where we gave a couple examples of types of things that the uh, team can consider. And we asked contracting activities to report back to us on things that they have done so we can then share best practices. Uh, you'll see why we did that um, on the next slide. Uh, but uh, finally, the one pending policy that we have is, you may have already been uh, be aware, uh, it's where we're looking to explore different ways to reduce single-use plastics, so a very um, targeted uh, subject. We've seen lots of interest on this topic uh, from the public, 
We're in the process of reconciling thousands of public comments on our advanced notice of proposed rulemaking. Uh, but this is certainly an area where I can see the subcommittee's recommendations uh, very valuable. Uh, so some of the comments we've seen, uh, we can certainly get into more detail in future meetings on, uh, on those comments, but uh, a lot of them are kind of tailored to very specific uh, perspectives, kind of assuming that uh, we're, we're thinking about implementing in a very specific acquisition program. But the fact is we have lots of different acquisition programs, uh, which I'll take you through a few, uh, through a few of them on the next slide. Right. Uh, so I've grouped, I've grouped the programs into two basic buckets, but I could spend certainly hours talking about any one of these individual programs. And there's teams of GSA folks who work on each of these who could talk uh, uh, about much more uh, detail than I could. Uh, so the first bucket is uh, um, where we own or lease about 9,500 federal buildings, like office buildings, courthouses, labs, uh, post offices, land ports of entry, uh, data processing centers. Um, and that makes us the primary uh, buyer of electricity for the US government. Uh, we've committed to zero emissions uh, federal buildings by 2045. Uh, we've already uh, reduced emissions by 50% from our baseline. We've uh, recently developed standards to reduce embodied carbon and building design and construction. We have uh, a request for information to see if we can do the same thing for clean domestic solar power. We have standards in our facility maintenance contracts that look at sustainability. Uh, and we have folks who are buying and disposing and only focused on buying and disposing federal property. So there's lots of uh, different tracks you could take in the, the federal buildings, the landlord um, area. Then the second bucket is America's buyer. Uh, you may have heard of OMB's category management strategy. That thinks about uh, strategies to ensure that agencies are managing their spend correctly or in a smart way. So GSA is uh, lead six of the 10 common categories of spend, meaning of the 10 most common things that government buys. GSA is the subject matter expert in six of them. We provide a gamut of acquisition services from pre-positioned contracts agencies can use on their own, schedules in the GWACs to full assisted acquisitions and pretty much anything in between. GSA is the mandatory source for non-tactical vehicles uh, that the US government purchases. Uh, we're the preferred source for leasing motor, motor vehicles. Um, we've committed to a zero emission fleet by 2035. We recently established uh, government-wide contracts for electric vehicle charging stations and infrastructure where our public building service has a contract for the installation services. Uh, FAST or Federal Acquisition Service has EPAs for equipment and ancillary services. Uh, we also operate the charge card program known as SmartPay. Uh, we award managed airline contracts for federal employee travel. We manage several different buying channels, um, making up two and a half million part numbers that uh, the government buys in the industrial product category. This is things like tools, uh, furniture, office supplies. Uh, in this program, customers can select various environmental attributes um, based on the product ordering. We manage the commercial platform where agencies can purchase off third-party websites and GSA manages the relationship with that 30 party website. Uh, right now we have Amazon, Overstock, and Fisher Scientific as those third-party uh, suppliers. Finally, we have a, a bunch of tools that agencies can use in the procurement process. Um, the slide I've listed a couple that I thought were most relevant, but there's there's lots more. Um, one being the acquisition gateway, where uh, we help OMB manage the category management hallways, the tools, templates, and data, all that stuff associated with category management. And then finally, the SF tool, which is the one I mentioned earlier. Um, uh, specifically the green procurement compilation in that tool. It helps the acquisition team know what types of sustainable practices are recommended based on what you're buying. This tool is pretty great. Um, this is just a snapshot of all the different things that we offer. Uh, I could talk for hours about it, but um, 
Next slide. Uh, do we have time to keep going? Yeah, yes, yeah, you're, please. Right, yeah, cool. you're doing good. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, so I thought it'd be helpful to outline, I know we're talking about workforce uh, in, in a few minutes, but there's also policy in this space that I thought would be helpful. Uh, next few uh, slides show a little bit about the different tiers that I talked about earlier and how they interplay with the workforce policy and how GSA has implemented government-wide policy. So federal acquisition certifications, they are government-wide, uh, the curriculum set by OMB. And GSA has decided that, uh, that curriculum doesn't necessarily work for some of the programs that we run. Um, and so uh, we need to uh, buy a little bit differently and have slightly different standards, mostly because the underlying policy on how you conduct those acquisitions is different. So the next slide actually goes into a little bit more explanation. The, so the FAR, the Federal Acquisition Regulations, is the guidebook for all of the uh, federal acquisition certifications. It targets the um, contracting officers, the contracting officer representatives, and the program managers for the, for the acquisition lane. But you'll see, uh, you can go ahead and move to the next slide, that that is not necessarily the case for some of the GSA acquisition programs. So for many of our programs, the underlying policies, not the FAR, uh, and so we've tailored the training programs uh, and how we certify the, the workforce that um, does those procurements. So for example, leasing, um, in my office, we issue the uh, leasing policy in collaboration with PBS in the GSA acquisition regulations, part 570, um, and other programs are guided by the federal management regulation or federal property management regulation. Um, so I'm not necessarily saying that this is really where the subcommittee should focus its efforts. It's more so an example of how the different subcommittees can interplay. Uh, plus, I don't want to interrupt Jeff Birch later as he's briefing. Um, so with that, I'm happy to take any questions. And thank you all for your time. Thanks so much, Nick. And we will uh, be able to open it up for questions right now. And I think uh, just to, you know, I'll, I'll have some general questions for each of our three presenters um, just to, to kick it off. Um, one, one being, uh, do you have any thoughts for us, Nick, on kind of where you see the biggest pain points of, um, you know, getting that the, the whole acquisition community used to thinking about sustainability and, and particularly for, for policy, um, are there, are there particular areas that, that come to mind where, um, you're hearing from folks across the government and the acquisition community that their, their policy barriers, or is it more a matter of trying to, to educate people? So that's my first question. Um, and my second question for, for all of our three speakers will be, um, we know GSE is, is really uh, heavily invested in, in all of this and, and doing some great work. Um, and would, would love to know, like, where are there other bright spots across the government so that we as a committee can help spread best practices and help each agency leverage good work going on elsewhere in the government. So if you if you have thoughts on either of those, um, that would be great. Uh, if you need to, to go back and kind of think about it, that's that's fine too. But um, uh, would would love to kind of get some guidance from GSA on on both of those questions. So to me, uh, in terms of the policy subcommittee. The when I talked about the three buckets of how you incorporate sustainability, um, I think the easy, the more of the easy button for the contracting officer is that third bucket when you infuse a compliance requirement for the, the vendor. So that's simpler for the contracting activity to, to, to implement. If there's a clause in the contract, they can just stick in the contract and, and hold folks accountable. I know that that uh, presents itself with lots of challenges for industry. Uh, and complying, uh, you have to ensure that, that there's competition, all that stuff. Uh, but you know, that's that's the easier thing to implement. I know if you're looking more towards the first bucket, the performance requirements, you kind of have to go industry by industry, and based on what it's totally based on what you're buying. 
it's kind of been our experience. Uh, but then, then again, so the tool, the SF tool, the green procurement compilation has been, uh, I think, one of the one of the better uh, to your to your second question, the better uh, practices that, that we've seen in helping the the teams work through like what would apply, what could potentially apply to my procurement. Great. Other questions from the committee members? I think Nigel has his hand up. Oh, great. Yeah. All right, Nigel, go ahead. Thanks, Troy. Uh, so just follow up on that last piece that you uh, mentioned with regards to the three buckets. Um, can you provide your view on, you know, there are other requirements included in prime contracting goals, right? So you, you know, companies get points, um, get credits uh, as a part of their uh, bid proposals when it comes to subcontracting plans or diversity spend, uh, uh, working with uh, designated entity firms and so forth, right? So included in that proposal in a competitive bid, um, that counts towards their ability to win that contract. What is your view on as we look towards opportunities to put something in for a vendor, right? Requirements for the vendor, putting that in as positive credits that can be counted towards a bid proposal versus something that on the back end. Is that something that could be incorporated there? So, yeah, we, so we've certainly seen that uh, in certain acquisitions. There's not a lot of of standards on how to potentially do that. There's uh, not a great guidebook on how to do that. But we, as one of the innovations that we've seen as part of one of those policies that we issued, encouraging innovation, that was exactly how uh, the contracting activity uh, decided to incorporate into the acquisition strategy was to um, give additional credits for those who, who had more sustainable outcomes. Can I follow up on Nigel's question, Nick? Um, so it seems that these innovation, these innovative examples have been taking place here and there. Would it be possible then for the committee to receive examples, specific language, so we have a better understanding of how this is maneuvered, how it's been maneuvered, how it's moved forward, um, so that we can forecast as well uh, individuals that are in the positions of making these decisions, how they value them, um, the idea of what, what does a more successful uh, type of language look like, uh, any sort of information related to this, I think, could prove very useful to the committee. Absolutely. Happy to share the, those best practices. And since we're playing tennis here with the same question, I'll follow up on Nicole uh, uh, with regards to legislative language, because again, with regards to things like diversity spend or subcontracting plans, uh, there was specific targeted legislative language talking about uh, certain goals and objectives in procurement being in the inherent interest of the government. So maybe we could, instead of reinventing the wheel, use some similar language uh, that was in legislation in order to drive contracting opportunities towards more innovative, sustainable solutions. Mamie has her hand up. Yes, Mamie. Yes, um, and if I missed this, I apologize. Um, how do you validate? Um, so past performance of firms, you would get references or there are some rating regarding their contracting abilities and quality. Uh, same thing around the teams, their qualifications, but how do you validate sustainability type requirements for be it a product that they're offering or yeah, mainly the product or the materials? Is it based on some rating 
some industry standard or am I making sense? Uh, So to me, I mean, just my, my, I think there's, there are standards only in certain areas. Uh, so it depends on if you're buying, um, if you're saying I want uh, bio-based, there may or may not be standards based on what you're buying. Uh, there, there are only standards in some areas uh, and there are often not standards in, any, in, in many areas. So I think that that is certainly a, a challenge that we struggle with. Uh, where there's not already pre-established standards, is there, a, or should you be uh, picking winners and lo losers based on sustainable approaches? And does the contracting team have the expertise to evaluate whether or not one proposal is uh, better than another? And when there's not standards set, that uh, becomes a, a very, very big challenge. Okay, thank you. And Nick, just to follow up on Mamie's question, do, do you see trends in the private sector of those standards being developed outside of government for, for different types of um, products and services? Yeah, I mean, I think that there are, uh, there are certainly efforts taking place to, to drive standards. Um, but not across the board. I think there's still certainly some gaps. That might be a good area to uh, explore where there are still gaps. Okay, uh, Luke. Hey, Nicholas, how are you? Uh, you know, you're you're a practitioner, and you're you know you've been doing this. I, I'm curious if you were sitting in our shoes, what challenge would you tackle first? And what area do you see as kind of most ripe for a, 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 a tackling, like most most receptive to a large kind of effort on our part? Luke, you, I think you uh, had good comments at the opening, uh, kind of the question of whether or not you start broad or with a, a scalpel. I would suggest the scalpel is probably going to be more effective uh, because. Um, I think it's it, it sees some some actual uh, progress made, uh, maybe even focusing on uh, a couple programs uh, that that can be something concrete uh, that can be uh, I don't know. That, I think that's a, a big question. Like we don't know where to start. That's a big <laughs> big reason why I think we could certainly use you all's uh, advice, though. Thank you. I appreciate that. And I think uh, I'm one and then Jenny. Hello, everybody. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, hello, Nicholas. And I wanted to follow up on the question that was posed by uh, Mami is um, in the area of construction materials, uh, there has been a fair amount, and that's my area of expertise. So uh, uh, where we've We've had a fair amount of effort in the last, I would say, 10 to 12 years in developing life cycle assessment based uh, environmental product declarations, which are conformant for with ISO 21930 or ISO 14025 that provides us um, standardized approaches to communicating environmental uh, potential environmental impacts of asphalt, concrete, steel. And um, environmental product declarations, they are present in the language uh, uh, for, the, for IRA, the Inflation Reduction Act, and uh, Federal Highways has been working on those, uh, you know, using those EPDs as part of <clears throat> the conversation for, again, the standardized approach to whether a particular product when it is being acquired, is it... Uh, um, is it sustainable or not? And of course, we're only looking at the environmental aspects of it, which is one component of sustainability for sure. Um, and GSA last fall, or end of last year, they came up with a, a specification for uh, environmentally preferred asphalt and low carbon concrete. And so that work is already there. So going, you know, so there is some grounding that we can start working on. And I think Federal Highways has various efforts that we've been involved with. Uh, in developing standards uh, and protocols to use life cycle assessment based approaches, uh, as well as EPDs, um, environmental product declarations. 
Uh, and then there are various states that have bike lane related uh, initiatives and, and legislation in place where the Colorado just uh, recently having um, come up with a specification for construction materials. Thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to chime in. I'm Jenny Romer, Deputy Assistant Administrator for Pollution Prevention at EPA. And so part, part of the program that I oversee at EPA is uh, the Environmentally Preferable Purchasing Program, or EPP. And so we have 37 recommended eco-labels and standards uh, that are recommended for federal purchasing. Uh, and we really see a big, I see a big opportunity to update and create more, a more streamlined multi-attribute approach there. Uh, and I did want to also flag that we're, we have a, we're planning an expansion um, to assess new eco-labels and standards according to our, our framework that was released earlier this year. And so uh, keep an eye out for that as well. But I think there's a a big role to play, um, but there are so many factors that federal procurement officers need to take into account and in figuring out how we can do that more, more efficiently and effectively. Um, it's I think a really good place to be looking here. So thank you. Thank you, Jenny. And uh, David, you had your hand up as well. Yeah, thanks, Nicholas, for the presentation. It was helpful for me. And frankly, uh, great to hear that um, the government has gone to category management as a way of developing SMEs in various categories and developing strategies for those categories. That could be helpful. I think Luke is on the on the something big here with respect to the size and scale of this effort. Uh, and so one of the things that would be of interest to me is if we could be provided, if you think this would be of value, a list of the various categories that are currently being managed by the various teams throughout the government. Uh, I think there may be some value in plotting those categories relative to sustainability in terms of ease of implementation uh, versus the value associated with that category in terms of reducing emissions and so forth, and then building a, uh, a prioritization uh, of what we may go after first or talk about first and try to address because this is a very, this is a very big elephant, and trying to eat it all in one bite is not within the realm of possibility. Yes. So is that something you can make available yeah. to us? The category structure of uh, sort of buying category structure. If that one's for me, uh, yes, that's that's certainly. Widely available, we can we can help show you where that is. Great, thanks, thanks. Okay, I'm just I'm looking at. I, th I think we got to everyone who had their hand up. Does anyone else uh, have a question? I think I see Mamie or Liz, uh, Mamie or Anish. It looks like Anish has a question as well. Um, um, yeah. Yes, I have a, uh, just a follow up. Is is he's talking about the system approach? The the person right in front of me. That question I think makes sense in the system wide and the integration aspect and any intersections around the various government agencies and what they're doing. But my concern also is around there's sustainable processes and there's sustainable material. So uh, maybe I might be missing some category, but that would also be helpful too. Uh, I know the contracting aspect deals with life cycle management as well as those things that are easy to get rid of and less impact to the environment. So I don't, I don't know how that is looked at as a whole or separate. Um, just just a thought, not necessarily expecting an answer. <laughs> hey, Nick, um, is there any type of data around um, workforce or reaction response to current 
sustainability policies? Have we ever queried the workforce on whether they have questions, whether there's confusion, um, how they think the policy is going? It's a good question. I don't, I, yeah. there's nothing that comes to mind uh, in terms of okay. you know, workforce surveys, but I don't think sustainable policy. Right. Actually. It just, questions. yeah, just occurs to me there are a lot of impactful policies in place today, and it might be one way to start is to try to understand how that's being implemented today and if there's areas for improvement. And, and Anish, you had your hand up as well. Yes, thanks. Um, I, I know there's, you know, you went through the slide where you went through the different categories of acquisition. So there's travel, there's you know buildings, facility maintenance. So all these things are addressed differently in policy. I'm curious if you can provide us guidance on which of those categories maybe are less need, in need of an update or maybe are off the table that we shouldn't necessarily focus our attention on um, just to narrow our focus a little bit. Um, so my intent by that slide was to, that was basically the, that's the majority of the stuff that GSA does. So if we focus recommendations, it would be in any one of those or all of those areas. I think they're uh, kind of looking at the different programs. There's different ways that each of them tackle sustainable acquisition. Some, I think, tackle just by the standards that are in the FAR. Uh, some through the requirements versions, the requirements, performance requirements, uh, and very few by evaluation uh, uh, methodologies. So it, that was more of the uh, the full landscape, and for you guys to kind of consider which of those, or if, uh, which one of those you would would want to focus on or prioritize. All right, let's. Uh... Steve, did you have your hand up? Uh, I was just going to briefly follow up to say that using um, Nick's three buckets, when I hear about GSA's role with regard to air travel, obviously that's much more of a requirements issue. We're not going to put that on the procurement professionals, but if agency leaders basically said, hey, people need to travel less and we're going to create impediments to traveling, that would really make a big difference. But that's not something the procurement professionals can deal with. And I think one of the things that's so important about the three buckets that Nick started with is it is a very common pathology in federal procurement. And I don't want to say to blame the acquisition workforce, but to expect the acquisition system to fix larger pathologies. The procurement professionals in the United States government are not going to stop people from flying. Um, GSA isn't going to do that. But if agency heads sent a strong signal that this is something that we should be doing in terms of changing behavior, that would make a difference. But again, each of the things, as Nick mentioned, is different depending upon what the industries and the responsibilities are. Thanks, Steve. That's a great point. And uh, David, your hand is still up. Did you have anything else to add or is that a hand up from a couple of minutes ago? Uh, it's just a broken hand. I'll lower it. I do that all the time. <laughs> all right. Well, all right. Thanks all. Thank you, Nick, especially um, for, for leading us in this discussion. Very helpful. And I think when um, this subcommittee first meets that this will really help uh, jumpstart a, a, a conversation on priority. So I, uh, Boris, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think now we're going to just head to a short 10 minute break and then we'll reconvene and have a, a similar discussion um, about the industry partnership subcommittee. Yeah, that, that's right. I wanted to add a comment uh, for the members. So we want you to think about everything that was discussed here. This is exactly what we wanted to do. Uh, there was a plan to do some prioritization, but we really rather have the conversation we just had really. And we, I share with you all what has already been put up on the, on the board, if you will, last time we met in September and even before. So those items were shared with you. So we wanna think about that, but as you're listening to the discussions, think about what else should be on that whiteboard, uh, if you will. If you had a whiteboard with stickies, what else would you be putting on that whiteboard? So be thinking about that for the members, whether you put it on a chat or whether you just 
file it and then share it with us later. So be thinking about that. But this is exactly what the kind of conversation we wanted to have. So um, back to you, Troy. Okay, uh, great. Thank you, Boris. Everyone enjoy the 10 minutes and we will see you at 10 after.
Good afternoon. I'm just testing audio. Hey, Michael, I can hear you. Perfect. Awesome. And hopefully the smooth jazz that accompanies somebody sitting in a hotel lobby is not audible. <laughs> hey, that may not be a bad thing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my. So Hello, I will. Hey. Hi, 
I, while we're waiting to uh, get started with our next session, I wanted to remind um, everyone, particularly members in the public, uh, we have an inbox. Uh, so we have the gap fact at gsa.gov. So we welcome your comments, input. You can send us an email again, uh, gapfac at gsa.gov. Uh, if you heard something in this past session that interests you, please send us uh, comments via email. Uh, and you can certainly do that at any time during this session today, as well as after the session. So I'm gonna turn it back over to Troy. Oh, well, thank you so much for that re reminder, which I meant to work into my remarks as well. We do really wanna hear from the public, so thank you. And I am actually gonna turn it over to Cassius to lead this next leg of the discussion. All right. Thank you, Troy. Uh, and thank you everyone for, uh, for joining us today. Uh, we have, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, a unique opportunity to uh, really get some really good uh, in, uh, input from a lot of practitioners uh, for this particular segment of our industry partnership subcommittee discussion. Uh, we're going to hear from Michael Bloom from the great city of Chicago. Uh, Michael has spent the last couple, uh, several years, I'll say, at GSA, but actually in the uh, role as program advisor for high performance buildings the Office of Federal High Performance Green Buildings. Uh, Michael, uh, we, we appreciate you being here with us today. We appreciate the background jazz music as, as well. Ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome Michael Bloom. Good afternoon, and I'm actually calling you from Energy Exchange, where we just had fantastic interagency and industry discussions about energy and the president uh, agenda. Um, so excuse the potential background noise and the interesting background. Um, I am going, I'm super excited to talk about uh, this subject. I also want to say that um, I'm pleased when Nick brought up the sustainable facilities tool, otherwise known as SF tool. SFtool.gov is the address for that tool. And it is what I do with most of my time is I'm the guy who manages the awesome team behind that tool. And just to describe that quickly, because it's kind of good bridge, is that GSA created SF tool because we realized that we did huge projects really well because we had the industry experts with us either as consultants or as part of project teams when we did sustainable buildings but as long as 10 12 years ago we realized we needed to promulgate the best practices to our smallest of projects so we learned how to speak in plain english about complicated stuff and it only took a year after doing that well for the built environment that we realized the same kind of platform would help people in sustainable acquisition. Yeah. So we translated what used to be an Excel spreadsheet with all the rules that every agency independently comes up with uh, into a single place, which is why you, call, you uh, have this nice acronym GPC, which is the Green Product Compilation. Its goal, honestly, is to compile all the guidance from the federal agencies that apply to all the products and services that people buy into one place. So it's not GSA's creation. It's the creation of EPA and DOE and USDA and GSA collaborating to actually say, here are all the rules and let's link to what's great elsewhere and explain and provide the connective tissue between things where it's not there already. So that's what you'd find there. And I can't tell if you're looking at my face and I don't have slides. So you can go visit SF Tool while I'm talking if you wish um, so uh, that you find it and bookmark it for yourself. But I'm not going to just talk about SF Tool. In fact, um, when so, it comes to industry partnerships, one of the things that I'll speak to is the fact that everybody is aware of all these rules that need to be followed. But ultimately, when people are talking about procurement, they have a job that needs to get done and they need products and services to do that job. And then the thing that frustrates is everybody in the world is that they feel like they need to get everything right all the time and pay attention to every variable simultaneously. And when they do that, they throw up their arms and say, I'm not even going to bother sometimes unless you provide them easy ways to do that. So when I'm saying everything all the time, I'm not just talking about sustainably compliant products that are bio-based, recyclable, safe, non-toxic, energy and water efficient, or even increasingly PFAS, forever chemical free, or by American. I'm talking about all of that stuff, by the way but also th buying things from small and disadvantaged businesses, doing so in an equitable way, doing so in an environmentally just way. All of these things are variables that matter with, during procurement. All of them are important. 
Some of them are easier than others, like ego labels, and we'll talk about that in a moment, but all of them overwhelmed. So what we need most of all is easier ways to follow the rules that have been mostly on the books for a long time and now have significant money behind them and certain attention behind them that have the federal government say, yeah, Wait, this is now I, really important to us. So that's the context here. Um, um, when it comes to uh, I, I, uh, what, what sometimes is thought of as industry relations, we have a huge focus in the federal government about making sure that we are bringing um, opportunities to small business. That's absolutely important, but it is, and it may even be, and I believe it is, the background of lots of you who are self-selecting into the industry relations uh, subcommittee. But there are other things besides that, and I'm not giving that short trip. I just think that's probably better understood than many other things GSA is currently doing. That's important, but what else is important? Um, let me tell you a story, and it comes from, it's kind of gonna illustrate the power that you all have as the gap fact and in your subcommittees to make a huge difference to how federal government does its work. About two years ago, the Green Building Advisory Committee, another federal advisory committee, just like GAPVAC, that's been around for more than 10 years, had a subcommittee that asked the key question, how can we get our arms around low embodied carbon materials? This came from a group just like all of you. They discussed it and spent about three or four months looking and surveying the field and asking experts, what is, how big is the impact or potential impact of low embodied carbon? Who knows about low embodied carbon? What can we do? Is there a difference between big projects and how this should be handled and small projects and how should this be handled? They asked great questions, which is exactly in your purview. And then they came up with an advice letter that said, hey, for big projects, we need whole building life cycle assessment performed so that we understand how to design and build with low embodied carbon materials. And then for smaller projects, they said, we need a materials approach. We need to pay attention to the materials that matter most. And here I'll just put in a plug for answering a question that was asked yeah, so of Nick. What do we do, scalpel or everything? Yeah. I would say my answer is, a hotspot study to figure out where you apply that scalpel. So don't just go into one place, but look at our categories of spend and figure yeah, out where you make the most difference. And also when you do that, and this is that digression I'm going off of, because I have no slide that I need to stay on, um, is if you're doing a hotspot study, you need to decide, is it what cost, what we spend the most money on or where we might save the most carbon, um, right? Or both. And then if you decide both, how are you going to explain to the people who need to make decisions how to trade off those two? Um, these are the complexities of now. Um, I do think that hot spots and making sure we're not trying to do everything everywhere is key to simplification. So I got on a digression, but let me go back to the story. So the GBAC wrote an advice letter. Great. Advice is advice. The federal government can take it or leave it. We don't like smart people doing a ton of work and then just leaving it. So what happened with that advice? Well, the advice letter that said, here's how you might proceed is exactly what led to roundtables with GSA talking to industry. And this is something that we need to do more of about how ready is industry to meet this kind of aggressive goal. And they had a round table with uh, members of industry. And most of the people at the round table, when they were talking about concrete and asphalt said, we're ready now. Yes, there's regional variation. Yes, we need to ramp up, but some of us have been ready for years. You, you guys just need to buy this stuff. You've been asking for it enough already. We're ready. So we actually do regularly need industry to tell us how fast we can move and still foster competition, fairness, and support small business at the same time. And I think that that's something that this group, by the way, could do. But they did more, not just a round table. The round table led to an RFI, a request for information to industry. All the asphalt and concrete um, manufacturers across the country, over 80 um, gave their feedback early, over 120 eventually. And so industry participated in saying, this is what we're ready for. This is where it's a challenge. Um, and you saw, and it was already mentioned that the concrete and asphalt standards came out months ago. Yes. And they're already being used on projects. 
this is not something that was a pie in the sky advice letter done by a bunch of people on an ivory tower. This was real work done on real problems and then industry saying, yes, we're ready to go. And the government listening. So um, we have that. And not only did that RFI go out for concrete and asphalt, but many of you are probably aware that just a couple of weeks ago, one went out for seven more materials, steel, glass, aluminum, insulation, roofing materials, gypsum boards, and structurally engineered wood. If any of you are part of industries that use that or manufacture that, please respond to that RFI. Um, but also encourage people that you know to respond to the RFI. That is part of what we're asking for. And hopefully we'll be able to move as fast on those things as we did on concrete and asphalt and get them into real projects. So success story about how what you are asked to do can actually work in real life based on examples and the fact that carbon being the universal kind of how much carbon will that say both embodied carbon and operational carbon really helps us actually have a metric that we haven't had in a while that we have or agreed to uh, to talk about while i'm on that subject um yes i breathe occasionally so huh. okay so while i'm on that subject metrics or what we call things and how we categorize things matter greatly if the federal government and industry could get on the same page about what we want to call things, we might even have a better way of coming up with standards that help people do the right thing with those things. Um, this is a big library science problem, and it's not a pretend one. The only reason why um, we can build tools like SF Tool and its partner SF Tool Product Search, which actually uses all the registries the federal government has and all the eco labels to actually show you which products comply is because we have um, large data and we can sort that data to answer our needs. But if we don't have good names for things and categories and agreed upon standards, then we don't have any organized data and we don't have any questions we can easily answer. So getting on the same page with nomenclature and uh, data management is a huge part of getting sustainable procurement right. Okay, what else? Um, we talk about buying things procuring services is also important and the the green procurement compilation we talk a lot about products but you will find sample solicitation language sample contract language and even language so that when you're writing a custodial contract or a cafeteria contract or a fleet contract that says when you are doing this work here are the products that matter in order to do that sustainably and the tools that we've provided that we've built at gsa again with doe and usda and and epa's help um, actually already give a lot of those examples and where we're missing that one of the things you may want to do as a subcommittee is actually help us figure out what's missing and what we should do in addition to what we already say what additional language would be happy would be great to have modern templates for how to actually go out and procure the right things in the high performance okay um other things going up a scale so we have buildings we have products uh, we also have uh service contracts, specifically energy savings performance contracts or ESPCs and utility energy service contracts, UESCs. And these two things are procured uh, or you, we use these tools to get third party investment to uh, improve buildings and do deep energy retrofits in buildings, having industry participation in um, continued discussions about how to do that more would be very helpful. Um, let's see. I think I only have one or two additional things to say. Oh, when it comes to uh, schedule vendors, obviously people know that getting on GSA schedule helps. We also care greatly about transparency and making sure that the tools that we offer at GSA actually reflect the best things you ought to purchase. I've been on a uh, I've re I would really like to see us change the defaults in how our procurement systems work. So we see compliant products first only, and we have to work harder to find those exceptions. Um, and I'm hopeful that we might be able to do that kind of change and recommending ways in which we can put um, uh, the the compliant products first in any one of the systems we use to procure um, would be welcome as well. Also, um, GSA 
this is another plug for industry participation. GSA has invested a great deal in improving the quality of the data behind its programs. And they have a program called the Verified Product Portal that was um, built to make sure that we had no uh, incorrect products on systems like GSA Advantage or under contract. But the Verified Product Portal only has useful information if industry feeds it useful information. And so figuring out a pathway or a portal for those uh, manufacturers and those folks in industry to provide the federal government writ large with the most up-to-date information about their products would be very helpful. And the VPP, Verified Product Portal, seems to be a way for us to do that without um, without having uh, a huge burden fall on any individual or industry. So watch for discussions perhaps about how we can actually share more information like recycled content information, like what does and doesn't have PFAS, like those things that are not yet covered by eco labels um, that might actually help feed making the take buy the right thing, right buy the right service, um, and make sure that it's considering all those variables I mentioned at the top of the uh, discussion about sustainability and small business and equ equity and environmental justice all at the same time requires that we have the data at our fingertips to make those decisions. And I'll stop there and take questions. Michael, I, I want to kind of just uh, jump back to something you mentioned previously um, when you talked about uh, some of the committee members uh, contributing to updated uh, technology. Um, is there a particular a source or um, um, a particular area where committee members can say, this is where I can kind of say this, these are new trends, this is new uh, trending um, technology? Um, can you define technology in your question so I understand right. how to yeah. answer? Oh, seriously, and my technology is just, I use a different word than you use. <laughs> so it's just really we're talking about trending or, or, or when uh, members can add new, uh, it wasn't technology, but it was something basic, uh, the support of um, new ideas, new trending issues, new trending opportunities that can add value to this particular committee. So that's what the committee discussions are going to do generally. Yes. When it comes to my earliest solicitation of help, it was basically, I think, yes. relevant to sftool.gov. And we actually have sftool at gsa.gov if you have comments of any type that you want to share about things that that tool that purports to represent the collection of what's best practice in government. If we're missing something, you can you can email us there. Also, if you're at sftool.gov at the bottom right hand side, there's an email. So you don't need to memorize anything. <laughs> and thank you. And the word was best practice. And you just there said you go. thank you. <laughs> thank you. Are there any any other questions for Michael? Let's take a look and see where we have. Where's our hand? Uh, Steven has a question on your mute. Uh, I'm willing to let Farad go first if he's ready. Oh, that's right. No, I bow down to you, Mr. Steve. I bow down. Uh, okay, so first, uh, Michael, let me say thanks so much for joining us. Uh, I want to mention two things. I was ecstatic to hear your reference to uh, what I think of as defaults in terms of products and making them available. And I think that one thing, if I was going to talk about low-hanging fruit or easy wins for GSA, most of the folks probably in this room know that on the federal supply schedule, there's an environmental aisle, but you have to know it's there and go look for it. And if anybody who studied environment or uh, what do you call it, behavioral economics or nudge theory, we would know that one way to change a staggering volume of outcomes would be if someone or individual agencies basically said, when you order from the federal supply schedule, you must order from the environmental aisle or do a DNF, a determination and findings as to why you didn't. So you're not saying you can't order something else, but we could change literally staggering numbers of purchasing decisions overnight with basically no training required whatsoever. So that's what I would call low hanging fruit 
and the kind of impact stuff that I think we should be focusing on. But I also want to come back just for a moment to the SF tool. And again, for anyone who hasn't used it, the SF tool is truly impressive. My question for you, Michael, is are people aware of it? What kind of training is available to normal 1102s or acquisition professionals? What does the usage look like? We've, we've already talked a little bit about measurement. Uh, what are we doing as a government to move the staggering number of procurement professionals up the learning curve so that they know that that thing is there and what do they use it for? I'll also mention that I've talked to a lot of people who say, I go to the SF tool and I'm overwhelmed. There's so much stuff there. I need someone to take me by the hand. And like, for example, the, the ones I often hear, if I was just gonna distinguish DAU from FAI for a moment, DAU has wonderful stuff like the contracting cone or the adaptive acquisition framework or the acquisition subway map, where I basically take you by the hand and walk you through. So are there thoughts um, or are we thinking about how to make these tools more accessible and to prioritize the most important things so that people don't go to them and just throw their hands up? Thanks, Michael. <laughs> A lot of questions there. You're welcome. Um, yes, um, SF tool has between uh, seven and a half and 12,000 visits per week currently. Um, about 40% of those are going for procurement related content. We also have things like cost effective upgrades and great building and uh, information there. So that's one of your answers. We are challenged by the fact that we have a tool that's useful and even does have user guides right on the front page. Uh, no, if you're a pro procurement professional so, that still has people go, wait, I'm overwhelmed. So I agree. So, I am all ears so, for people the, saying, um, here's some ex right. ideas for how to be more effective, right. more and more well known in terms of out there. At department um, at the energy exchange, um, SF tool came up in no less than six different sessions, and I wasn't speaking to all of them, um, where people were saying, hey, and this tool's here. So it's it's hit um, critical mass and in some ways, in part because it now matters to multiple agencies in the government, and it's very clear that the workforce needs to be literate in climate literacy and sustainable procurement literacy, and SF Tool is here for, to help both. So people are looking for solutions, and now it's finally there. But it's been really hard to, to um, ramp up the numbers. One of the things I will say is that we intentionally built the tool so that feds can use it, so can states, so can international community, so can our contractors. So when you want to be on the same page as the whole project team, when you're doing this work, you need to have this access to the same sheet of music. And we're hoping that that'll make a difference too. But it does take the will and the focus. The other thing that we don't have, we don't have the mandate. So then nobody's saying you must use this tool. Would that help? Um, almost always. Um, but it still needs to be clear to people when they come, well, how do I do this? So the access to training, we are going to be putting um, quick bite five minute trainings about SF tool on the site itself starting in February. We also currently have a LinkedIn page, which is unusual for a federal tool, but it's there. It's SF, it's sustainable facilities tool. And if you follow us there every week, we do a different focus spotlight on a new, on part of the tool. So that's something we're doing. Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, we're there on all of them. And to the extent that you and people like all of you follow us, then it will help spread the word too. And we're, like I said, all years to more uh, ideas. I think I missed some of your question, questions, but I, I will stop here. Michael, thank, thank you for, for that. I, um, definitely wanted to say um, you answered actually part of the question I was trying to ask. I think Stephen asked and you, you answered as well too about right. getting the information out, knowing where we can have data, updated data, and where folks can actually know. And that's very good to know about LinkedIn as well too. That's, that's un, 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 uncommon. That's mm -hmm. really uncommon. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. Farad. I think a far less um, sophisticated academic question. Um, really just creating um, a dashboard. And so if we can, if we can somehow maybe see a dashboard. Can y'all hear me? Yeah, we, we can hear you. Okay. Yeah, it's in and out. If, if we could just create a dashboard of, of some of the topics that we're talking about that are important around the way we utilize it for record, where the spin is, it would be very helpful. 
So thank you. Okay. Okay. Are there are there any other questions? I, know I was looking in the chat and see if we had some additional information. Thank you for forwarding uh, the LinkedIn uh, link as well, Michael. Um, we have a question from Nicole uh, Darnell. Nicole. Hey, Michael, just a really quick question about your, it was the VPP, the Verified Product Portal. Can you tell me a little bit about that verification process? What, how, how is, sorry, how is verification defined here? So the intent for that, and this is not my program, it's just a program I know enough no. to be dangerous, um, is Actually, that the um, Verified Product Portal, they invested in it because they wanted to eliminate counterfeit products yeah. from being on exactly. federal schedule um, and also yeah. um, open up opportunities for industry to give uh, GSA information that we would otherwise lack. It's information that in part when it comes to sustainable products, the SF tool and the SF tool product search have, have a huge amount, but we don't have all the information that the VPP has about product sins and individual product numbers, kind of the holy grail for figuring out how to map requirements yeah. um, that are out there in the world yeah. to products and knowing that they're okay to buy. So what we're trying to use the VPC for, and this is managed by GSA's office, Federal Acquisition Service, Josh Royko, and I was gonna get some email, um, uh, is to figure out a way to have an open channel for um, communication with industry to fill in the gaps in our data about products. Thanks. I, I just have one quick follow up if I could um, related to the SF tool. So I, I think I heard you say that 40% of users are utilizing the tool for procurement and acquisition. Is that accurate? Yes. Is that it? Are those data being tracked with respect to the spend so that we could get a sense of what proportion of the, the um, monies are being redirected in a sustainable way? Not directly. And part of the reason is because when you're past the privacy laws for the internet that they did, we no longer can track the difference between federal agencies visiting the tool and where they're coming from. We used to see that information on the back end of people looking at Google Analytics for websites. So it's no longer possible. And since we don't have a required login, um, we can't track that through SF tool direct. But what I will tell you, and one of the incentives to kind of encourage people to use SF tool and SF tool product search where you can actually yeah. do the research on the products yeah, that meet yeah. the compliant rules is ideas. that when you use SF tool as a research tool and you keep track of what you plan to buy and then buy, it does the reporting for you of exactly how much did you buy of sustainable products. In fact, anything that uses energy or water, it will track how much energy and water you saved over the thing that you replaced because it gives you a chance to do that. And so if we encourage people to report actual procurement of sustainable products, not just we have the right contract language and that's what we're counting. If they're tracking actual procurements and they're using our tool, then their big burden of that report at the end of the year is already done automatically. And Sandia National Labs has actually done that part of this work by encouraging their contractors and subcontractors to use SF tool in order to do the research, create the report, and submit that report to the person who actually pays the invoice for everything that they bought. And they don't get the invoice paid until the report's done. So they've kind of built in the incentive and that we can track. It's our hope that we're able to roll that out to other national labs, but also federal government wide with the right kind of support. Terrific, thank you. Great, and I think we have a question. Uh, Richard has his hands up. Yeah, hi, Michael, uh, Rich Butel. Um, I was looking at the SF tool here just a moment ago and saw how it, it, uh, it uh, directly addresses the content or ingredients of products um, and how they're manufactured. But what I didn't see in there um, were uh, anything reflecting the, the, the enormous transition in federal procurement away from the acquisition of goods to the acquisition of services, which now predominate in terms of dollar value uh, across the federal landscape. And so my question is, 
is the SF tool uh, uh, flexible enough to encompass, for example, operational characteristics, for example, data centers? I, I do a lot of work in cloud and IT uh, procurement. And the, the fashion and means by which these huge data centers consume power and impact the environment. Um, uh, so, so with respect to service procurements or service acquisitions, such as, as reflected by SaaS, IaaS, and PaaS-based software product offerings and services, how would the ST tool uh, 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 change or grow to encompass those types of acquisition practices? Yeah, you point out a lacuna or a missing component of what we do currently, and we don't delve into IT services. Um, but if you go to the procure section of SF tool um, and you look on the right hand side of the page, it's all about services. There are seven categories there of services. It is not hard for us if there are rules and best practices for the IT sector to add additional data there. In fact, the outcome of uh, the reason SF tool has a phenomenal health and building section is because the GBAC, the Green Building Advisory Committee, just like you guys, by the way, um, did a deep dive into that and yeah, we reflected yeah. the work of that committee on the tool. So if individuals or the committees as, as in entities have additions, it's easy for us to add the uh, information that we have gaps on. And the one that's coming this year will be on environment, uh, EV charging and EV um, from the basics. What do you need to think about when designing it as an engineer? What do you need to do about managing the policies around charging stations and buildings as from the policy or the manager side and everything in between. So we try to be holistic about what we do. And until you mentioned it, I kind of not thinking in terms of data centers and, and service as, and software as a service as something that might take that sustainability lens and, and apply it and show sample language, but that's a great idea. A quick follow up then, um, you raised the issue of charging stations, for example. Um, does the does the does the uh, does the SF tool uh, go beyond just the con just the nature of the charging station itself and, and address whether the electricity that is being provided through that through that uh, device uh, is using uh, sustainable uh, generation methods? Yeah, you nailed it. The um, whenever we do talk about something and we don't yet talk about charging stations, that's coming soon. Um, we make sure to show the the trade-offs and the things you need to be aware of. We can say all we want about how awesome green roofs are for reducing the heat island effect in a building. But if you don't talk to the engineers first and make sure that your roof can actually support structurally the, the green roof, then you made absolutely the wrong decision. So when you go into SF tool, and this is the non-procure stuff, this is, hey, health, climate, energy, water, Go in and explore those. You'll see that we start from the basics and we do flag all of those things like don't do this without considering that. Um, kind of what is the best advice you could get from project managers that have done this in industry and in government over the last few years so that you can actually specify the right thing when you want to do any of these projects. That's very much uh, up the alley. And when we talk about EVs, we absolutely need to talk about what you just brought up. Excellent. Nigel, we have a question. Yes, thanks. Uh, and just following up on that, does that also apply? And how do we account for construction services? Right. So we're looking at the IIJA, a lot of money going into, you know, clean buildings, environmentally sustained buildings uh, and renewable projects. Um, but deconstructing, removing recycling, right? All the building materials and all of that. How do we account for that? Because I don't see anything on the right hand side of this uh under services for you know infrastructure or construction how do we Sorry. measure that and account for that so the low embodied carbon material discussion is really pushing attention onto deconstruction and reuse of building materials that is something that again is on our plate for building into the tool in the next few months um and 
and again, it's it's following on from people's attention to it's not just the new buildings or it's not just the operational carbon we need to manage. It's making sure that the materials we're putting in our buildings are minimizing the carbon we're putting into the environment as we go. So we have not incorporated a deep content on reuse, but we um, have some of it and it's associated with the low carbon materials component of the question. These are great ideas. Um, I hope, uh, Boris and, and Troy, that we have that I haven't gone too long. Uh, but I really appreciate this opportunity. And I also wanted to flag the fact that I intend to keep supporting this committee, um, Boris and the whole team, from the background, not as the speaker. So I'm not going anywhere as you do your actual work. I, I will be uh, available to you as a resource if you have additional questions. Hey, hey, Michael, on that on that vein, would you mind giving the group just a snapshot of, of the Green Building Advisory Committee just for awareness, uh, just, a, you know, kind of the the 10,000 foot level view? Oh, you mean what a committee like yours actually is like <laughs> when it's been functioning for 10 years? Sure, sure. <laughs> okay. Um, so I think some of that was covered in the very first meeting. So um, I, I help support that committee. Ken uh, Sandler is my colleague in the Office of Federal High Performance Green Buildings that runs it. The, the GBAC was created at the exact same time as our office was created. The idea was if we have a Office of Federal High Performance Green Buildings, you better have a good opening for industry and people not in the federal government to advise you so that you're aware of innovation and about how things work in uh, other parts of the real world. Um, and so the GBAC has been around for um, more than 10 years. Um, what, uh, yeah, thank you to, uh, for those of you who are on the um, chat, working chat part, you can see um, some resources there. There is a fantastic uh, GBAC uh, website that shows all of the past advice letters that have been created by that group. Some of them I already talked about in low and body carbon, health and buildings, um, grid efficient buildings. So buildings that are actually able to work with the grid to give the grid power. That's been something that's talked about. Last year, we also had environmental justice and equity task group really grappling with how do you engage better with communities that are traditionally disadvantaged communities. Um, around all projects of all sizes. That, by the way, led to that um, deep discussion about equity and environmental justice, um, while challenging at times, because it was new to all the architects and engineers that tend to make up most of the people who are on that committee, led to new, two new positions on the GBAC that are explicitly uh, environmental justice and equity uh, lived and uh, professional experience uh, focused to make sure that we're no longer thinking about that second, just like we're no longer thinking about sustainability um, or any of the other roles when we're doing business. So that's something recent that has been done there. The um, Let's see, what else is important? Um, we meet twice a year uh, in used to be in person. Now we meet twice a year as a whole group uh, virtually. Those meetings are public just like yours. Um, and so if you're curious about what's happening on that side of the, of the fence, you're welcome to listen into those calls. The next one is the 9th of November. So it might be instructive to listen in as a new committee about what a functioning committee uh, is like and how it's run. Um, I know that uh, Boris and, and the team here is very well prepared to handle your own meetings like this one and others. Um, Boris, what else do you want to know? Uh, no, but just turn it back over to Cassius uh, okay. to see if uh, just kind of see if anybody else had any questions or comments. Sure. Thank you again, Michael, and uh, thank you for the uh, the additional uh, details. Also, for the links uh, for those who are, um, you can see some of the links in the uh, webinar chat to take a look. Um, I don't see any other questions at this time. Um, just checking. With that being said, we're going to break. Um, it seems like we're about five minutes ahead. Um, if we can come back at three o'clock, um, we come back at three o'clock, that's a good time for us. Mm -hmm. And we'll start back up with Troy at three o'clock. So we'll sign off now. We can stay on, we'll sign off. We'll be back so, on at three o'clock. 
Yeah, one more comment before we go on break is for those of you in the public uh, that would like to submit any comments or if you have any questions, again, uh, feel free to use our inbox, uh, the uh, GAPFAC at gsa.gov. And uh, you've been hearing a lot of great discussion. So please uh, chime in comments that you have and we, we'll be glad to take a look at those. We want to make sure we engage you as well. So thank you. Uh, otherwise, we're ready to go on break and see you back at three. Okay.
Well, hello, as we're bringing everybody back uh, for the last session, I wanted to uh, just a couple of reminders again for members of the public. If you are interested in uh, chiming in in any way, shape, or form, please use the uh, the inbox, uh, gapfac at gsa.gov. Uh, for the members, I wanted to also comment that as, as we're hearing a lot of great input here from our GSA colleagues, uh, feel free to think about items or topics that you think are going to be uh, ones that you want to consider in your subcommittees. Uh, we, we created an initial list from the previous uh, month discussion, but please uh, be thinking about that. Feel free to drop them in to the uh, the chat, or you can just email them as well. Uh, we just want to make sure that we're capturing all of this because uh, when you get into your individual subcommittees, you'll have the opportunity to really think through uh, what are the things that will rise to the top. But uh, I feel like um, so far we've gotten a lot, and um, looking forward to to the the next session here. So I'll pass it back over to uh, Troy and Cassius. Yeah, thank you, Boris. And now we are going to have a discussion about really what, where the rubber meets the road, because none of what we're going to talk about as a committee will work unless the acquisition workforce is educated and empowered to, um, to, to make the right choices. And so I am just really um, pleased to welcome Jeff Birch to join this discussion. He's the director of the Federal Acquisition Institute, which is um, housed within GSA, um, he also works very closely with um, uh, the Office of Federal Procurement Policy over at OMB, which has, has a, a, a statutory role also in overseeing the office, and works really with uh, over 200,000 federal employees across the government um, at any one time and, and helping them uh, and helping educate them about acquisition. And I, Jeff, I think one, one thing we'll want to talk about is how we define the acquisition workforce. And um, you and I have had, had a conversation over the years about how important it is not to narrowly define that because there's so many uh, people involved in any program or project who uh, have a role in making sure that acquisitions are, are successful. So I am thrilled to have you here. Jeff, it's great to see you, and I will turn it over to you. Thanks, everybody. I appreciate the opportunity to talk about the workforce, because like Troy just said, I mean, nothing gets done in government or anywhere else without the people. So um, always happy to talk about the workforce. Uh, one thing I'd like to do is give you just a quick overview of FAI, just so you can put it in perspective, because some of the agencies also have training schools. So here's the FBI team. Um, this is the largest the team has been in several years. Um, FAI, the um, composition of the team has had ebbs and flows over time. It was, FAI was established in 1976. Um, and we have a big mission, but we have a small but mighty team. So um, these are the people in front of you that make FAI operate successfully every day. Um, so FAI, like I said, was established in 1976. We do work very closely with OMB, specifically Office of Federal Procurement Policy, um, Joni Newhart. Um, we, what we do is the FAI team supports OFPP in implementing their acquisition workforce policies and government-wide career development initiatives. So um, we'll talk a little bit more about that. But specifically, what I want to focus on today is, you know, about certification training and also about where the contracting workforce is moving to um, in the upcoming year. Next. <clears throat> okay, so um, I said we had a small and mighty team. These are our statutory responsibilities. And as you can see right there, we divide them into three buckets. If you look on the right hand side, you'll see that the career and development bucket is the largest or the circles, the largest. And then we have human capital planning and we have acquisition research. So what has happened at FAI over, I'm going to say that at least the past 12 years is there has been a major focus on training certification, certification training and also lifelong learning training and then career development. So we are constantly not only developing courses, 
and training aids, but we are also maintaining the training that we have. <clears throat> Next. Okay, so um, when I talk about the certifications, and Nick touched on this earlier in his presentation, what I want to do is talk about the government-wide certifications that are mandated by Office of Federal Procurement Policy, and regardless of what agency workforce members may sit at, if you take a contracting core or program project management certification, we all operate by the same training requirements, okay? So all across these three functional areas, for many years, we have had three levels of certification. In contracting, in contracting officers representatives, and in program project management. So that is going to be changing in the upcoming year. One thing that Nick also mentioned was that he was talking about specific certifications on at GSA. So these, as I said, these three certifications, regardless of where you sit, you have the same requirements. Um, what happens though is agencies have the latitude given by OFPP to supplement this training. But if the agency doesn't supplement the training with maybe um, agency specific training or some other type of continuous learning or something um, in that regard what happens is once you complete the training you are certified however uh, what we're seeing is almost every agency supplements the um, OMB certification requirements the training requirements so um, for example GSA uh, you know there's a, the scrim EO that was signed and that's we developed two courses so far. So what GSA did is for their acquisition workforce, they required all of their workforce members to complete that course. So, you know, they probably already had one of these certifications, but they supplemented it with the GSA specific training that was required. Okay, next. So what I want to do here is talk about contracting where where it was for DOD, where it still is for FAI, but we're moving to um, a new paradigm. So, for, as I mentioned earlier, the three certification um, levels, what happened was there are three elements when it comes to like career development and becoming a experienced, capable um, workforce member and being able to perform. So, the three level certification currently, and I'm talking specifically about contracting, is approximately 650 hours of required training. That's 650 hours. However, on top of that, what happens is every two years, workforce members are required to achieve 80 continuous learning points to maintain their certification. Where we're moving to, and DOD is already there, we're moving to align with DOD, which is moving to a single level certification, single level certification framework. That required training is approximately 200 hours or actually a little bit over 200 hours. So if you notice, there's what? A, a significant difference between the two, the training requirements, number of hours. So there was a lot of concern about that initially. However, the certification training is just one element of achieving a certification with the new framework, the single level certification framework. What happens is you're all, the workforce members are also required to um, achieve credentials. Credentials are will be determined based on the workforce member and the supervisor, and the credentials will depend on what type of contracting actions that the individuals perform. So we have been actively involved with um, DAU and Defense Pricing and Contracting over the past, well, we have a close partnership with them, but over the past two years, we've been heavily involved with them as they were moving from the three level certification to the single level. And so what's happening is we've always wanted to have reciprocity with DAU. I think we're going to get there this time when we move to the single level certification. And the reason for that is, is 
<clears throat> we are actually, once you achieve your certification, between the certification, right after the cert certification, we have, we will have a mandatory assessment. So that's the same for DOD. The mandatory assessment, all the workforce members are required to complete it. If you're already certified, you do not, the workforce members do not have to go and complete the single level certification training. They, they stay at the certification level that they have. But when the workforce member, once they complete that um, assessment, they move into the credential area. And again, um, we're aligning with DOD. We've been working with DOD or DAU specifically in developing credentials. Um, and what we're finding is there's a there's more commonality with DOD and civilian agencies and procurement than differences. So we've really been working closely to ensure that we can leverage the learning resources, the career development opportunities, and things that that things of that nature to develop these workforce members and leverage all the resources. So we can be doing other things or expand the types of training or career development opportunities, activities like that, that enables workforce members to achieve, increase their skill set. But not only that, go on experiential learning development opportunities to grow. So <clears throat> what we're saying is that this model that we're moving to is a lifelong learning model, right? So what we're doing is we've always talked about continuous learning. However, when we talk about continuous learning, oftentimes the workforce members say, okay, what course can I take to achieve my continuous learning point? Well, the policy, the OMB policy on continuous learning is much broader than that. We've also, FAI's developed a fact sheet because we kept getting inquiries about what course can I take? I've already taken this course, I've already taken that course. What we did is we compiled a list of continuous learning opportunities that individuals can do besides just taking another course. Because what we were finding was that workforce members were oftentimes taking the course for a second time. Not that that's a bad thing, but it, it was pretty uh, systemic across the workforce community where they were just taking the same course. So some of those examples would be writing an article, um, doing a, a brown bag luncheon, something like that at the specific agency, um, doing a detail assignment. So one thing we really want to hone in on this time around with certification is with certification, even from the very beginning, we said it was a three-legged stool, education, training, and experience. What we were finding in the former certification, the three-level certification was individuals were completing their training back to back to back without any experience opportunities in between those learning experiences when they were taking the training. Um, We've always been challenged with, we, you know, when I was at DAU, Defense Acquisition University, I was the Director of Acquisition Career Management for the Defense Agency. And so it's not something that's unique across the civilian community. It is, it is common across the workforce where the workforce members keep looking at, okay, I want to take this course, I want to take that course. And so what we want to do is slow them down. And there's been discussion for years about this, but find ways to ensure that the supervisor works with the workforce members to ensure that they are having an opportunity to, to apply those skills that they learn over their, um, that were, that they've achieved over their um, taking, completing the required training. So again, let me just, Jimmy, let me just summarize this real quickly. The three level certification, FAI is still using that. Um, the single level certification, we are moving towards that and will be implemented at the end of the year or the first part of um, 24 um, across the civilian agencies. However, right now <clears throat> we have a few agencies that um, are kind of championing the single level certification and being early adopters of that framework. And so GSE is one of those early adopters. And so they've been heavily involved with 
um, with us in working with the policy, working with the identifying credentials. There's just, there's a lot of work required anytime you make significant changes like this. Any questions so far? Okay. Next. And Jeff, I uh, just yeah. wanted to make a comment just for the public to know we were having some difficulty with the ASL uh, translators, but go ahead and continue. So we, there was just some technical difficulties, but we, that's what we're not seeing the ASL. Okay, yeah, by, by all means, right interrupt me if you're not hearing everything I'm saying or have a question. Okay. Uh, next slide. Next slide, please. Okay, so I noticed this um, when I took the presentation out of a Google Doc and put it into PowerPoint that all the numbers changed. Didn't notice it until I was looking at the slide. Um, so one thing I wanted to talk about also is our focus areas. So right now in FY23, we're continuing to focus on FACSE modernization. FACSE is the modernization, is the initiative that will move the civilian community from a three-level certification framework to a single-level framework. Uh, we've been working on that a year and a half so far. We've uh, work very closely with representatives from the agencies, civilian agencies. Um, Chris Highback on the FAI team is leading that effort. She's been doing a great job, but there's a lot of work. They've been also ensuring that the outreach and change management has been happening all along the way. In fact, today we had our quarterly interagency acquisition management, career management committee meeting and that's always a topic of interest for the attendees is, okay, so what happened since last time we met? Well, what's happening in the faculty modernization area? So Joni, um, she always attends these meetings also because when it comes to the policy, it's actually OFPP that does the policy. We support OFPP with implementing that policy in a standard way across the civilian agency. Um, the second area that we're, we will continue to focus in, and I appreciate the correction, is the um, training, development, and maintenance. So as you are aware, there have been many executive orders issued, um, let, uh, some of them being put into legislation. So we have been very busy creating courses to support those executive orders. For example, uh, the Buy American Office and Buy American Changes that are taking place. We have, and again, let me go back to the collaboration with DAU and the relationship with DAU. Initial, um, prior to this past year, we had, we meaning the FAI for the civilian community, we had a Buy American course. DOD had a Buy American course. <clears throat> what we wanted to do was come together and try to develop a course that could be used for both populations. We were on that path for a while, but we had to part ways. Not the relationship is excellent, but it was the, the um, requirements were so different that needed to be communicated to the um, defense acquisition workforce community. So we still work with them and they actually worked with us in developing two job aids to support by American <clears throat> um, executive order. And those, those two job aids are actually available on the FAI website now. The new course may have been deployed. We we're waiting, it wasn't gonna be affected until the 25th, which was a few days ago. We were, um, but we had to wait before we, <clears throat> excuse me, before we could actually deploy that course to ensure the course contained the information that the final rule, um, required and so we you know we work collaboratively with the far team <clears throat> the far team and members of the chief acquisition officer council so we get a lot of help from the various agencies the third item that we're really focusing on and it's a continuation of maturing cornerstone on demand uh, a year and a half ago, we migrated from a government-wide learning management system that had been customized, and it was um, supported by a contractor. And once it was implemented, it continued to grow based on agency requirements. So FATAS is called Federal Acquisition Institute Training Application System. It, the FATAS system 
everybody liked it, it was because it was customized, as I just mentioned, but also if they wanted something changed, <clears throat> what they would do is they would have, we had a configuration advisory board and oftentimes they got, we were able to make the change for each of the agencies. However, our goal was to, and we moved away that for several reasons. One, it was costly. Two, it we had several outages. So we wanted to move to a commercial platform. We did an alternative of analysis. And what happened was it was ultimately decided that we were moving to um, Cornerstone on Demand platform. Um, initially, our plan was to have our own instance of it. But what we did um, was we partnered with DAU. DAU, acts, I, I worked at DAU for almost 14 years. DAU had already implemented CSUN, but their implementation was solely on the training registration aspect. Okay, just that. Well, what we did at the I was we worked with um, the DAU team, Booz Allen, who was their support contractor. And what we did is our ultimate goal was to try to put those functionalities that were in CSOT in, I mean, that were into FATAS into CSOT. Um, we were successful in doing that. However, what that required was it required the agencies um, to have business process reengineering all across their training certification areas in terms of, you know, the process. <clears throat> The processes were not going to be the same because, again, it's commercial platform, um, and Paytas was so customized. So you're not, we're not going to find. We knew we weren't going to find a comparable system Paytas right out, right out of the box. So we were successful in doing that. We had a lot of agency support. It was a significant change. So we had a um, a, a very extensive change management campaign happening to ensure that all the workforce members were ready and prepared for cornerstone on demand. There were a few bumps along the way. Um, what we have seen, <clears throat> excuse me, what we have seen though is we see agencies becoming more comfortable with it because like with anything new, especially an um, IT system, they're becoming more comfortable with it. So they're starting to use it more. Um, what we have for that, we have the same for FATAS is we have a, um, an advisory board, and that is made up of seven reps from across the agencies, the larger agencies that look at, okay, what are the biggest challenges across the agencies, and what are those challenges can FAI try to solve that will have the largest impact across all of government? So that's kind of like our prioritization. We always look at those bigger areas that if we could change, it would help more people out. That's not to say that agencies don't get some of their issues resolved, they do. Um, and in fact, we've had many office hours um, supporting the implementation of CSI. I wanna move now to performance metrics. Not that we have not had performance metrics, we have, but one thing that we've really seen is um, we collect information. Ideally, we'd be able to provide metrics. We'd be able to provide data. And when you and when three people walked away, they would walk away with the same interpretation. That wasn't always happening. So what we're really focusing on this year is going to be identifying data set, identifying metrics, um, defining the metric and the source of where that information, that data is coming from. Just so regardless of who you call it FBI, if you need data, we will be pulling it from the same source going to the same system um, to get that information. Also, not only that, you know, we, we've all been working, I'm sure just as the same as in the government, the commercial um, sector about, you know, making data informed decisions. So we will continue to do that, but we're really trying to increase the integrity of the data that we have. And then stakeholder engagement. That's really a focused area. We, we have great working relationships with the agencies. The agencies have been very supportive in providing agency resources to FAI to help us develop these government-wide initiatives. Um, and so what we've seen that that does is it reduces duplicative development efforts because you have agency representation 
And so, you know, even though agencies may have a specific process to follow, they we get their buy-in when we involve them in these uh, training development efforts, tools, or anything like that. So the agents, again, we at the I also have a board of directors. We have eight members on the board of directors, um, and the majority of them are come from agency training schools. So um, DAU was mentioned earlier, DAU Defense Acquisition University, um, they have several campuses, the main campus is at Fort Belvoir. Um, they have a little over 600 faculty and staff. As you saw on the FAI, FAI org chart, we have 13 um, people. Both of us have um, contractor support, but what, we're, what we've really been doing is leveraging the resources that DAU has. And um, they've been great partners. And um, we will continue, and that also happens with some of the agencies that have training schools. So if you think about the VA, they have the VA Acquisition Academy up in Frederick, Maryland. So, you know, we work with them also. So what we're really trying to do is build a better, a better government, a better workforce by leveraging resources that support the greater good of government across the acquisition workforce. And I think that is it. Thank you so much, Jeff. Oh, sure. Um, this is a, a, a I great, know let me, I realize I need to change my view here to know like who might have their hand up um but just just really wanted to to thank you um and antonio i think you have your hand up yeah first uh jeff let me thank you for the presentation it was very very sure. helpful and insightful um so we're you know looking at all of the work aspects that this committee uh, will be tackling mm -hmm. and i'm just kind of curious how do you see the um the sustainability environmental components being handled within the, the, the coursework. Do you so, see it being its own separate, you know, module that we're going to have a, a focus on? Do you see it being blended in throughout uh, everywhere? And then sort of a second follow-up question is as you go to this um, shorter hour model one mm -hmm. instead of three, um, more broadly, so I'm a, I'm a Fed, I work for the Small Business Administration. Mm -hmm. Just a little bit curious how that fits into um, the FACC versus FACC one versus two versus three, because of course we have certain position designations that require, you know, FACC or some may only require FAC, uh, FACC one instead of uh, FACC three. Yeah, and Basil's actually on our IACMC this morning, so he was talking about that as well. Basil, um, he's the SBA. Um, acquisition career manager. So um, going back to your first question about sustainability, so we have developed and we deployed the end of last month a sustainability course. It is climate um, adaptation course for program managers. That's not to say that we won't continue to develop courses, but when we talk about the acquisition work for, workforce, we're talking about we will talk to whatever topic or subject that is relative to how it plays into procurement, right? Mm -hmm. So um, Lashanka <clears throat> on the FAI team, she involved um, CEQ, there were others. So we don't just develop it internal to FAI. We reach out because if you look at some of the executive orders that requires us to, you know, GSA, which comes down to FAI, work through various um, organizations to ensure that we're providing a larger view of what the requirement is. Um, so right now we we have the one course. It's you know the first one that we have. That's not to say that based on feedback, based on OFPP, that we won't develop another course. Or if there is information that is um, applicable to all of training, all of the workforce, um, because we, we do talk about um, the acquisition workforce. It's, it, it's and I think, well, no, um, um, I totally lost my thought here. Um, but, in, but anyway, it, it was, 
we do have that course. The second, your second question was relative to the um, disparity about the 650 hours to the 200 hours. And right. that, that was a big change management effort for um, DOD as well. But what the challenge was, and I um, had several positions at DAU, I, I think back to when I was an instructor. So what happened was I would teach the con basic course, contracting basic course. It was four weeks in residence, okay? Oftentimes I had um, defense contract management employees in that course. They weren't worried about what took place in week one, two, and three. They were only concerned about what happened in the last week of that when we talked about contract administration. So right. what we found was, and this is nothing new, is that we were requiring, and this is across DOD and civilian agency. What happening? What was happening was we were just force feeding these these workforce members with all this information. They weren't retaining it. So mm -hmm. the whole purpose of going to the I mean, it was turned back to basics, is to let's give the people the information that they need to get started, and they will right. build their skills as they go. Yeah. So um, it, it is a drastic change. And, you know, the, like I said, the first thing that people looked at was, oh, my God, what's happening to, you know. But mm -hmm. again, going back to the lifelong learning module, yeah. The framework, I mean, there are so many training resources out there for free that people can take. Um, we encourage everybody to do that, right? So just because you're not taking a course because it's required, that doesn't prevent you from um, looking at other opportunities. And so, yeah. you know, with the younger workforce members, I mean, they don't think twice about jumping online, finding what they need, mm -hmm. and it works for them, right? They're not overwhelmed. They get what they want in 30 minutes, and then they go on. So um, and that was a, a complaint on all of our critiques was that you know it's too much information for us to retain um so right. it, it's been a long time coming but at least we've gotten there um moving to giving the information making it available at the point of need um and and it people are happy with it so far at least on the DOD yeah. side because they have metrics to support well, that you know i was, I was just going to compliment you on integrating experiential use of what you've learned before you mm -hmm. come back and get more. Uh, I think that was that was a big change that uh, mm -hmm. would be very welcome. Yep. The other part, of course, you know, the you, you do that four week course and most of the folks that went through it in our team, they had the jitters, you know, because they had to right. pass that, yeah. that test. So it was very stressful. You know, it wasn't just like you're going to take this class and yep. you're going to automatically pass. And uh, you know a lot of job requirements were on uh, were you know were were tied directly to your success there. So uh, it sounds like some 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 good changes. In, yeah, we, right, we put right. some thoughts behind it. And 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 when we first started talking about this on the civilian agency side, um, there was there was concern about having an assessment, right? Because some people aren't good test takers. I'm one of them. Yeah. Um, so there was concern about that. But what we plan on doing, again, mirroring what DAU has done, is we will have a prep um, session. Individuals can take it online. Um, and they actually have three opportunities to pass the exam. Right. So, um, you know, I, I, that we're hoping to see, and DAU hasn't collected, you know, that much, that many metrics on this because, you know, it hasn't even been deployed a year yet, the single level certification. But um, surprisingly, the numbers I saw, and it's been a month or two months ago, um, the number of failures were minimal. And when I say minimal, we're talking like five out of 200. And, you know, mm -hmm. that's only they failed the first time around. That's not right. to say that they failed and oh, they yeah, failed yeah. good. Um, but, yeah, there there has been a lot of um, concern about the exam. But, again, that's one of the requirements that we have to um, achieve in order to have uh, reciprocity with DOD because you know the whole goal is to make this workforce the newer workforce all the workforce um, increase mobility across the various agencies and the departments and with the newer workforce we have to do that because they are going to move in and out of government agencies and all that because they you know for the most part they don't want to stay somewhere like I have um, for 30 years right so I I have 20 years DOD, and then 10 years, which I found out today, I will have in um, January. 
I said nine years, but someone corrected me on the team and said, Jeff, it's not nine. So, um, you know, and that's for, it's, it's great that they are that motivated to continue and grow their skills. And that's what we're hoping that they'll do. I appreciate the response. Thank you so much. Oh, sure, sure. And thank you for that. And um, I'm thinking back now fondly on many hours I spent with Rich Butel, who's on the call, when we were working on the Hill and trying to get some parity <laughs> for the yeah. civil workforce with DOD on the acquisition workforce. So that I think it's 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 a, a, a lot for this committee and the subcommittees to to dive into. Um, so I think we go to next, Nicole and Steve. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Jeff. Um, I'm sure. Presentation was really informative. And Antonio, you, you stole my thunder a little bit, but I am going to build on uh, where you started. I, I have two questions for you, Jeff, and one's at a very high level, and then mm -hmm. one is a bit more specific. So looking ahead from your vantage point, what do you see as some of the most prominent pain points related to embedding sustainability in federal acquisition? I, I think for some people it's new. So um, they're looking at, not that they haven't been concerned about it, but it's such a greater focus. And so I, I don't see that as a real challenge. I think it's just something that um, it's like we were talking about, you know, uh, sustainable products and all that. So how, how do we increase the visibility, the importance, or not importance, but the access to that information to help the workforce members purchase goods that support all types of sustainability initiatives? Um, and I, I, I can tell you, what, you know, when we revised the courseware, I mean, we included other topics based on um, competence, competency models that we used. And there has there isn't has not been resistance to that. So I really don't see, see that as a big pain point. Uh, I see it as something that will um, individuals will gain that skill set. And so right now it is not a credential, but that doesn't mean we won't develop a credential centered around that. If the, if there is enough interest and enough workforce members supporting that we could very well develop a credential. And DAU has actually developed several credentials. Um, we are working on our first, um, working with OFPP, they wanted to try to do something ahead of actually implementing the policy and innovation credential. So um, we've established a framework and um, based on workforce need and input from our stakeholders, that could very well be a credential. But currently it's just a course. Right. So, and my second question relates to this climate adaptation course that you have mm -hmm. for program managers. Mm -hmm. um, is are you collecting feedback on the extent to which that course is really meeting their needs for thinking about how to drive sustainability and acquisition? And I, I bring this up because, mm -hmm. um, it, and it connects with the prior presentation related to the SF tool and the complexities that individuals are encountering actually using that tool. It feels overwhelming. Mm -hmm. So it seems like we need a, a, a really strong bridge here between the tools that are available and the training that we deliver in order to reach a place where people feel empowered to think in a really productive way about how to embed sustainability in, in acquisition. Yeah, and, and so one thing that we've done is, and everybody wants to do good, right? We, we want to give the workforce members all the tools that they need to be successful. Um, and oftentimes, well, not oftentimes, we always have good intent, but what happens sometimes is it can be overwhelming, mm -hmm. right? So you have these workforce members, and one thing I always um, stressed when I was at EU was, in order for these tools to really be used, it needs to be integrated in their work process. You, you can't have someone do a solicitation and all of a sudden, oh, I didn't know there was this tool over at DAU, the, the map, um, so I forget the exact word, but anyway, it's like the um, roadmap. We have a roadmap too. So again, our big focus is at FAI is to not duplicate, work together, um, communicate, and do outreach opportunities so we can use our money smartly because our budget, FBI's budget, is nothing in comparison to DAU's budget. And I'm not faulting them. I came from DAU. I'm, I'm happy for them. 
but I can tell you that this has been a great year for FAI so far because we, you know, we really do have support for looking at other ways of increasing our funding. Um, more to come on that, but um, we have a lot of support. So I'm Thank glad you. to see that. And, and you know what, Nicole, I didn't answer your question about in my tracking metrics yet. The course was literally just um, deployed September 30th. I'm, and I, the, the only person that I know, and this was a week or so ago, the first day it was deployed was Chris Heidbeck on, on our team. She took it right away. Um, so it, we've been developing a lot of new courseware um, and training opportunities. So again, I mean, when I first came to on the civilian side, I, I said was, my motto was, there's one government, right? It doesn't matter if you're on DOD or the civilian agency side, it's one government. So we should really be intentional about working across agency boundaries, organization boundaries, whatever you want to call it, and come together. And we have really stressed that across the FAI team. And we're seeing a lot of people willing to do that. So it, it's much brighter now than it has been 10 years ago. Great. Thank you, Jeff. Oh, sure. That's great to hear. I think um, Steve and Daryl have their hands up still. And, and Daryl, if, if you have a, a more singular question, I'll let you go first because I have a lot. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm actually was curious and maybe following up on Nicole a bit. Um, about the credentials, and, and and really, I'm I'm learning here. So, could you tell me what um, when you were talking about credentials for the workforce, what what would be some examples of the credentials that they would have now? And it's it's not like you know they're going to be working with their supervisor to kind of figure out what credentials they need and so forth. But um, since there's not a sustainability credential, and, and by the way. I'm an, I'm an architect, so I, I, I know all about the whole lead, you know, credentials and things that architects have to have and the stuff that we do in that field. So I was curious how that would play out. So, so first of all, what you can do now is you can actually go to dau.edu and they actually have a page that provides credentials. Okay. Um, and, and they have developed many credentials already. Um, our goal is to leverage them where we can um, and then also develop our own if they are that different between DOD and uh, civilian agencies, but also if we can identify credentials that are relevant to government, um, nothing to say that our hands are tied not being able to adopt that. So um, what we're really working on right now is a framework around it, because what we don't want is we have a course out there and we call it a credential. I mean, it's really not, right? So, so we're trying to put some parameters around what a credential is. And again, leveraging what DAU has already done so we don't duplicate. And, and the second question I have, again, I'm curious, because you talked about agencies, civilian, civilian agencies, and I, I'm, I sort of got to, you were separating the defense DOD mm -hmm. with everybody else. But is it really all the other agencies, all the other, other government agencies? And I was curious if the FAA was included in that. So, yeah, so FAI's mission is uh, focusing on the chief financial officer organizations, agencies. However, what we did, I want to say probably four years ago, before I became, well, it had to be longer than four years ago, but anyway, we did several years back was, um, there was a lot of interest in FAI trying to support the small agency, members of the small agency council. And so we have just migrated then into, into Cornerstone On Demand, um, working with Joni, she's a big supporter of all of the agencies and um, the small agency council lead, uh, Juliet, we've worked to ensure that they have those learning resources and are able to take advantage of whatever FAI has to um, expand their skill set. Um, and, and what we did is we brought almost 100 small members of the small agency council over into Seaside. And they've always been able to take the FAI training. But what was different this time is when we had um, the smaller agencies into FATAS, what happened was we had six volunteers to support all of those agencies, the smaller agencies. And it, again, it was volunteer and they supported us. It, we owe them, 
for all the support they provided to FAI, which provided support to all of the smaller agencies. But now we've actually made them independent where they can go in and manage their workforce. So we have been spending a lot of time with them, you know, providing them training on Seaside um, and just making sure that they feel comfortable supporting their agency workforce members because they, we can have an agency out there that has two workforce members. Um, or you can have a GSA, a VA, or a DHS who has thousands of workforce members. And talking about a challenge, one of the biggest challenges I see across government on the civilian agency side is the way the role of the acquisition career manager is resourced. Um, as expected, you would have a VA person, you know, they have their own training academy. It is resourced well, maybe not as well as it was, but it's resourced well, and they have a whole team to support their workforce. And then you have other smaller CFO Act agencies that are not resourced the same, right? So the acquisition career manager responsibility, that position may be dual-hatted. They may only be in a, served as an ACM for part of their 40 hours or 80 hours, whatever it may be. So one thing we've really been focusing on is how do we elevate the role of the acquisition workforce member? Elevate it to be someone that is, you have a dedicated full-time person to support the acquisition workforce community of their um, department or agency. Thank you. And um, I'm available. I'd be happy to talk to anybody who has specific questions or, you know, another um, inter meeting like this or individually, feel free to reach out to me. And I'm, um, and uh, Troy, they all have my contact information, as well as Jeff Coase is my boss. I think that all three of our guest speakers today might be called upon again in the future as, as resources. Um, so, Steve, do you have a few more questions? Yeah, and, and Jeff, I'll apologize. I don't expect you to be able to answer all of them. Um, but, but first, let me say, as a consumer of information, I actually think it's very encouraging to see someone with DAU background at FAI. I think the context is really important. Uh, one thing I didn't hear you mention, but I hope we'll hear more about, is I know that as DAU and FAI are talking together, there's also some effort being made to bring NCMA and the private sector certifying bodies into the fold. Okay. And I hope you'll continue to think about that as well. Um, I, I guess one thing I just, and maybe this is a question, but while I congratulate you on getting that first course out on adaptation, mm -hmm. I am kind of curious when the first course is coming on mitigation, right? right. So again, those are different issues. We yep. can talk yep. more about that later. Um, but I think what I, what I was most troubled by, and maybe you can kind of push me in the right direction is, mm -hmm. I think it's good that you make a course available, but what you've done, particularly when you talk about the subspecialties, is we're suggesting that if people are interested, you'll give them some resources. But what I'm not hearing from FAI, and I surely am not hearing from DAU yet, is that they consider sustainable procurement a core competency, mm -hmm. or that it's part of the body of knowledge, or it's something that everyone needs to understand. And I think that first, that's important if we care and we want behavioral change, mm -hmm. but it also means we take a different approach. And we talked about this a little bit earlier, but I, I look at the DAU webpage and the resources, and I see things like the contracting cone and the acquisition, the adaptive acquisition framework and the contracting subway. And we were talking to Michael earlier about the SF page. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what we don't have is a good resource where an acquisition professional comes to DAU <laughs> or FAI or anybody and says, where do I start? Where do I go? How do I work through this? What's my pathway? And again, these meta sites, which DAU has outsourced, and I think some of them were outsourced to MITRE, are incredibly powerful tools. And I guess what I'm hoping is that you or someone is going to be advocating for that in the future. Because when I think about a course is great, but for the tens of thousands of acquisition professionals, the learning curve involves language, concepts, resources, where to get help, 
and metrics, how they're going to be judged and how they know whether they're working. So anyway, any thoughts on that would be appreciated. Yeah, Thank so Steve, you. Just, just real quick. Yeah, about two years ago, we developed two, um, the career roadmap is what we called it. And then there was another one. I forget exactly what it is, like an experiential roadmap where um, it provided opportunities, things that you should consider, not that they were mandatory. Um, and our, our, our goal is to provide those resources because we know it can be overwhelming, especially to someone new coming into the field. Um, it's like, yeah, right, where do I start? So um, what, we're, what we've seen some agencies start to do is develop these tools when someone comes in, especially if they're a new entrant. You know, you could have people coming in from ministry, you've got people coming in from um, other civilian agencies or DUD that are already certified, right? But the way procurement and acquisition has been evolving, there's always going to be a need for people to hone in on their new, build new skills. Um, but no, I mean, I'm happy to talk with you anytime you want to. And um, yeah, I worked with FAI when I was at DAU and that's how I kind of got involved. And I have seen DAU, I mean, FAI come a long way. Even before I went there, they, they really started. And so um, I, I, I like, love my job and the focus that's being put on the civilian agency workforce members. Thank you so much, Jeff. And, oh, thank sure. you. and I, I know, um, Boris, we're, we're coming up on the four o'clock hour. So I want to be mindful of that. I think this has just been a great afternoon of um, he hearing from the experts at GSA and uh, just really um, providing a lot of ideas of uh, how the different subcommittees can really dive in and make the most difference. So thank you all uh, to Nick, Michael, and Jeff for uh, helping us out here today. And Boris, I just, uh, and, and Cassie, I also want to uh, check in with you too to, to, to see if you have any final thoughts, but I also just want to make sure that Boris has time for wrap up items and letting us know what's next. Uh, no, no, nothing other than that has been a yeah. fantastic day with a lot of information that I think is, uh, has been very valuable. So thank you everyone for your input and your suggestions. Yeah, and, and I, I echo all those comments. I really feel like it's been a wonderful day of learning. Uh, we spent a good amount of time this morning talking about procedures and, and administration of subcommittees. And then the afternoon, we certainly went into the, the deep dive that we were hoping would happen. It definitely happened. Uh, so I, I really appreciate everyone's uh, engagement today. Uh, a couple of things I wanted to mention before we close for the day. Uh, first of all, we are going to make a recording of this meeting available as we had done uh, in the previous one. Uh, there were some of our uh, members that had to drop off a little bit early today. So make sure that everybody gets the opportunity to, to hear all these great discussions. Uh, in terms of the subcommittee process, I wanna let you know too that we are working through the administrative process of appointing both uh, the subcommittee chairs and co-chairs and all subcommittee members. So we're working through that process as soon as possible. We'll definitely um, get you all up to speed on uh, when that's completed. And uh, I, I did wanna say uh, one, one comment when the subcommittee chairs and co-chairs were giving opening remarks, it's like, wow, I wanna join those, but I can't do it because I'm a DFO. So <laughs> my role is to make sure that we're, we're staying on track, but uh, it, I was really um, encouraged by, by all the comments that were made, but uh, those really stood out to me today, just here and there their perspectives. Um, also wanted to say that we're going to be following up with actions that were mentioned both this morning and then this afternoon. Uh, so we're tracking those. We have uh, we do uh, transcripts for our meetings. So we also have those available because there was so much information shared. I thank you to all of those who put comments on the chat. Uh, we track the chat as well. So we, we keep track of all of that. Uh, there was a lot of questions, there was a lot of resources. Uh, we made some comments uh, to follow up with each of our guest speakers. I wanna thank all of them, uh, Jeff, uh, Nick, and Michael. Uh, thank you for your wisdom and sharing so freely with us. Um, we're in the same community, so you know you're gonna be hearing from us uh, uh, going forward. Uh, we certainly cannot do this alone, that's for sure. And um, I want to say, too, that we're going to be uh, looking at uh, a meeting schedule. So as soon as our subcommittees are appointed, all the subcommittee members and chairs and co-chairs, uh, very quickly we'll be looking for 
a, a schedule of meetings that they're going to be at a pace of about every other week for each subcommittee. So you, there's going to be a lot. Um, the public will be hearing about it 15 days before through the Federal Register, at least 15 days before. And so we'll make sure that that happens. Uh, in terms of the next full committee meeting, uh, we're looking at either mid-December or January. Right now, the two days we're looking at either December 15 or January 12th. I don't know, if Stephanie, did I mention those dates correctly? Yes, you did. You did. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we're going to look at those two days, and it'll depend on availability, but also depend on progress in terms of giving sacrament, because we're going to enter holidays pretty quickly here. Uh, so we want to make sure we're navigating that as well. Um, and then the last thing I wanted to say is in terms of subcommittees, actually two things. Uh, one, um, please do think about your participation in subcommittees after what you heard today. Again, uh, you got to see what uh, we're thinking about um, in terms of topics, but uh, look at your participation where, where you express that preference and do consider uh, the workforce. If you're in the workforce, you're not allowed to go anywhere because <laughs> we're sure, I'm just kidding. Uh, but um, also uh, think about topics that the subcommittee could be taking on. So we share with you a summarized list of items for the three subcommittees. Um, we would have liked to hit some of those today, but really the discussion was really the, the main thing that we wanted today, and we definitely got that. Um, so think about that, uh, communicate with us um, often, as, as often as you like. And then we'll be reaching out to you, particularly uh, on the subcommittee front, to make sure that we're ready to go and start getting some work done here. Because this is um, just the discussion today was pretty, um, uh, pretty amazing how many opportunities there are to go. Um, Stephanie, is there anything else uh, on your on your mind? No, I don't have anything else. I just like to thank everyone. Always pleased to see you um, and engage. Absolutely. And I know uh, Jeff um, Kosas had to drop off earlier today, uh, but uh, he just uh, sends his regards to all of you. And uh, Crystal was going to try to uh, jump in in the meeting, but she wasn't able to do that as well. Um, so I, I, I have one more uh, word to Troy and Cassius before we close to see if they have other words to share before. Uh, no, just thank you all. I enjoyed the whole afternoon and, and thanks everybody. And this is all so exciting and um, a lot to dive into, but this is uh, for sorting through a, a, a lot of complex issues. I think this is the right group to be with. So thank you so much. Just adding, just ditto. Thank you everyone again for your time and volunteering your time and look forward to our next uh, next opportunity to, uh, to have robust uh, additional conversations. Thank you. Okay. Thank, okay. thank you very much, everybody. Right. So we're, we're going to go ahead and adjourn the meeting. And as you can see on the screen, if you're members of the public, again, we welcome your input through GAPFAC at gsa.gov. We also have a website that you can visit. Actually, if you Google uh, GAPFAC GSA, you'll be able to find our website just by, by Googling that. But here's the, the web address. We will post this presentation on our website uh, within the next couple of days. So those are going to be up on the website. Uh, again, committee members, a great pleasure to working with all of you. And I'm looking forward to getting to know all of you as we go into this great adventure together. So you all have a great rest of your day. Thank